will help you to uh, install Eclipse if you have brought in your laptop, right? Uh, but I only br brought in a version of Eclipse for the Windows. Not that I like Microsoft, but it's more prevalent. That's why I, uh, I, I don't hate Microsoft too. <laughs> but uh, I, I brought in a version of uh, JDK and uh, Eclipse for, for Windows. So if you have a laptop from, uh, uh, not from that foot, uh, then uh, we will, uh, we, well, I can help you install. And if you are bringing a, a Mac laptop, that's probably fine too. You, you connect to the network here, you can download the um, uh, JDK and the Eclipse also. Right? Unless you have it installed already. Right? Thanks for your, your information. Right. Say that again. You have JDE what? JDE. Oh, you use JDE also. That's, that's fine too. Alright, so if you're using other ID environment, that's perfectly fine. So long as you're comfortable with it. Alright, alright. And this young gentleman here, your name? Luca. Huh? Luca. Luca? Okay. And what grade are you in? Fifth. Fifth grade, alright, yeah. Have you done any programming before? Uh, Python. Python, alright. Python is the, uh, for a lot of people, Python is the first language they learn, right? It's very easy. Uh, do, do, do you know that Python is also object oriented? Um. It is also OOP also. And they are kind of free format also. You don't really have to declare something before you use it. That's why it's a good language to use as a first language also. And uh, what, what's your interest? Uh, I like reading and playing every game. Alright, yeah, alright. So. Yeah, any specific reasons you want to learn Java programming? Uh, no. No? Uh, your, your parents told you to? Or? No. No, you, you yourself want to, that's good. Yeah. Very good. Um, thank you so much for the information. And for a gentleman here? Uh, my name is Ryan. Brian? Uh, Ryan. 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 Uh, I'm in 8th grade. 8th grade, alright. And I'm just interested in technology in general. In general? Alright. So not, not just programming, maybe science, STEM in general. Sorry. Do you, do you have much experience in programming? Uh, I've done some Python and JavaScript. Alright. JavaScript also, huh? Yeah. Alright. Very yeah. interesting. Right. Thank you so much. Yeah. And the young lady here? Oh, I'm J1. Yeah. Um, I learned, I'm in 7th grade. Right. Did you say 7th grade? Yeah. 7th grade, we're all very young also. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I like reading and I'm interested in like maths and science. All right, yeah. And I know how to do C++, right. JavaScript, and Python. All right, all right, very good. All right. All right, thank you so much for your information. All right. And the lady here? Yeah. Um, I'm Alina, I'm in 8th grade. 8th grade. Um, my interests are debate and biology. Right. And um, I did Python a very long time ago, so I don't really remember much about it. Right. So. Well, that's okay. There's no test or anything like that in this class. Or, yeah. All right. And uh, any particular interest in, in Java programming? You want to do contests or robotics, anything like that? Or just in general? Uh, in general, I don't think anything. Right. Thank you for the information. Right. How about the gentleman here? Josh, in eighth grade. Uh, not really any experience mm -hmm. on programming. Okay, so perfectly fine, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just uh, want to do Java for maybe like schools, like classes in uh, high school. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, I see, I see. <coughs> I see. Yeah. Okay. How about the young lady here? I'm Nicole, I'm in 8th grade, um, I'm down some Python in Java. Right. And um, I want to like, take some classes for high school. Alright, alright, good. So most of you are very young actually, huh? Alright, so I'll keep this in mind also. Alright. So do you guys have any questions for me before we get started? Alright. You notice that I use lines, alright? So uh, it's just convenient for me. Um, there will be a reading assignment though. All right, so every week after the class, I'll ask you to read one chapter or two chapters. Like today, there will be two chapters. All right, and there will be some homework assignment. There will be some programming assignment too. All right. Remember my, my comparison with uh, learning martial art or maybe swimming. You have to do it, otherwise you, you won't learn. But you guys know, so most of you have some exposure to programming already. You know, you learn by programming, by actually doing it. Make sense, right? So I guess uh, we'll get started here. All right. So the text I chose is uh, Tony Gaddis' um, introduction to computers, and uh, it's called uh, Java from Control Structure Through Objects. Right? I think this author wrote multiple textbooks. This one is probably the uh, the best. Uh, it, it, when you teach, when you learn programming, you always struggle with two, with uh, with the sequence or the order in which you learn things. Uh, some educators think it's good to learn objects early, 
and then they introduce all the features later on. All right. And uh, some people believe that we should learn control structures first, looping, if then else, that kind of statements, and then you 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 gradually ease yourself into object-oriented programming. All right. Uh, in the college, I teach both. I try different approaches. My conclusion is actually better to learn control structure first. So we'll give you all the control structures. Once in a while, you see some features. Say, I don't understand what it is. Don't worry. We will explain what it is in the future. Once you understand the control structures first. All right. So that's, this is the strategy I'm using, and this is why I pick this textbook here. All right. And you know why in, in the future. Uh, all right. So um, in the first, uh, so today the goal is to. Uh, uh, there are a few goals I have today. A, I want to introduce to you what programming is all about. Most people do know, but I have to go through this anyway. And um, in this, uh, the second goal I have today is to make sure for those of you um, who want to do programming, uh, I want to make sure you have set up some kind of an IDE environment on your laptop. All right. So if you already have one, we're done. All right. All right. But I have some homework assignments for you, and I have some two very small programs that I want you to write also. Just to exercise your IDE environment. By the way, what does IDE stand for? It stands for Integrated Development Environment. So why do I need that? Well, you don't need that. It's a free country. You can really do everything by hand, manually. You can say, oh, I write my program with a text editor. I compile it. And then I run it all by all manually. Of course, you can do that. All right? But the IDE environment is integrated. They, allow, they give you an editor so you can write your program. They color code everything. All the keywords have the special colors. You can see what it looks like. You can right click in Eclipse. You can format your source code. They nicely, you know, make sure you don't, your indentation, everything, they align all the source code and everything for you. It makes it very easy for you. All right? And furthermore, within the environment, they linked to the JDK. JDK stands for Java Development Kit. It's where you compile your program. So they can compile program all within the same environment. They can run it. They can also run what we call a debugger. Debugger literally means that when I run a program, I take one step at a time. I take a look at all the variables, look at the environment, see if I've made any errors and all that. It's very good for you to debug into any errors or problems that you might have in your program. All right. So it's, it's actually very nice for the ID environment. And uh, but uh, from from programmer's perspective, ID environment is uh, an extra luxury, extra layer. You don't really have to have it. So long as you have access to a compiler. Right. Anyway, so today the purpose is A, to introduce to you the concept of uh, Java. And then also, um, I will talk a little bit about what a Java program looks like. And then my goal is to make sure that you have no problem installing or configuring a compiler or IT environment in your whatever compiler computers you have brought in. Makes sense, all right? Right. So I um I, I support I will support you both on Linux platform, on Windows, or if you're using a Mac, maybe a, a MacBook or whatever, MacBook Air, MacBook Pro. So I will support you also, right? So I don't think people carry around a Unix laptop or something like that. Maybe Linux laptop. Does anyone run Linux at home? Alright. Are there people who hate Microsoft enough? Who hate Apple enough that I'm not going to run any of the operating system? I'm going to run Linux. All right. I do run both. I run all three operating systems, so I should have no problem supporting you. All right. All right. So uh, you guys know what a computer looks like, right? So let me tell you a little bit about the history of Java. Java is a language. All right. So uh, it, it it can be traced all the way back, way before you were born, in 1991. All right. So uh, at that time, it was actually started by what, something some uh, project in, uh, in Sun Microsystems. But in case you do not know, Sun Microsystems went down. They, all, they already, they, the company no longer exists, right? So Oracle bought it um, in, uh, I think about 10, eight or nine, nine to 10 years ago, actually. Uh, around the same time, they also acquired BEA Systems, where it came from. In case you do not know, BEA Systems was uh, instrumental in building the, the operating system for the internet. And Sun Microsystem was in instrumental in building the language called Java. That tool environment works really well for the internet, actually. Right? Anyway, uh, this language is very different than the rest of the languages in the world. In fact, to this date, Java is still considered very unique. How unique? All right. Now, some of you mentioned you know something called you you, you do some problem in C plus plus two, right? What's the problem with a language called C plus plus? 
there's something called memory leaks. All right, this always happens. All right, I used to teach in a college many many years ago in Southern California. I realized that no matter how smart people are, when they write a C plus plus program, they have memory leaks. What is a memory leak? Memory me leaks means that when I write my program, I create some components, usually objects, and when I'm done, I forgot to remove them. It's like you go to your bathroom and you use up some garbage. You forgot to throw them away. So late, so slowly those garbage accumulate in the bathroom until it just blows up. I mean, no, not the bathroom. I mean, the, you, you use up all your space. That makes sense, right? Then your computer runs out of memory and your program crashes. It always happens. So it, uh, it always happens to C++ developers, right? So back in the mid-90s, when some microsystems introduced a Java language, they said, oh, we better have an automatic garbage collector. So when you write your programs, you, don't, you are not in charge of throwing away your garbage. Then you no longer need any more. We will take care of them. Java is the only language in the industry that's automatic garbage collection. That's really nice, all right? That means, oh, does it mean that when I write Java program, I will never create, um, I will never run out of memory? No, you still can have other forms of memory leaks, but much less likely to have a memory problem when using Java language, all right? So uh, most textbooks don't mention this. I used to do tuning on the enterprise soft ser server, so I know. So Java is a really a nice language. That's why Java is so prevalent in the industry. So everywhere you go to, you go to a bank, you go to a hospital. I just went to a hospital the other day. Um, I went to Kaiser. Very, you guys ever use Kaiser service? I don't know what, what medical sub a provider you guys are using. It's very computerized. So you see a doctor, doctor says, yeah, you should draw some blood, go to the second floor, then you just carry your little card there, they know all the procedures and all, very nice, right? You will notice that on an enterprise like that, most likely, in the back end, they're running Java. All right? Why? Because Java is so, so prevalent, so, it's so, mm, I think so prevalent in the enterprise. You can almost bet on, on the fact that banks, hospitals are all using Java. Does it make sense? All right. I want to give you some motivation about the, how prevalent Java is. Right? In fact, Java is the most popular language right now in the industry. Right? And at that time, in, in the mid-90s, it was just a language uh, developed for a desktop box. Though. So you guys know a TV desktop box? So when you change channels and all that, so you guys may be watching Netflix or something like that at home, right? Do you guys watch Netflix? You know what Netflix is? All right. So maybe you're too young, maybe you should not watch. So the black mirrors, we parents allow you to watch black mirrors. You know what black mirrors are? The episodes? Oh, thank goodness you're not watching that. You become very pessimistic about the future. <laughs> you watch those episodes. Uh, maybe too young for you to watch. Yeah. Anyway, Java was in invented as a language to be running on those desktop boxes back in the late 90s. Right? But then people realized, oh, wow, the language is so nice. Why don't we make it into a general purpose language? And that's the, uh, that's the birth of Java, actually. Right? So I won't go through all the details. And initially, um, the Java also, uh, they thought the future was about running a program on a browser. All right? So it's very interesting. When you're, within your browser, you can run a very small Java virtual machine. Right? So in those days, the idea is that we have a Java-enabled web browsers called Hot Java. It was demonstrated in, in Sun's uh, a world conference back in the mid 90s, and I think there was some of you may have seen this. Uh, uh, they, they run what we call an applet within your browser, it's actually a small Java program within a browser. And they introduce a character called a Duke. I don't know if you guys seen a Duke, it's a person with a hands like this, it's like a tooth, but it's called Duke or, or something like that. Doesn't matter, it doesn't exist anymore. All right, so uh, then people realize no, the future of Java is not about running a Java program with your browser, this is to running on the enterprise, for example. Right. Anyway, another thing is very interesting about Java is that it's cross-platform. Right. What, what do you mean by cross-platform? Yes? That it can run on any computer? Or... Exactly right. It's, it can run on multiple platforms too. I'll give you an example there. Suppose you want to write a C++ program. Maybe I want to write my calculator. All right. So if you want to run it on your on other Microsoft Windows, you actually have to go to your Microsoft environment, 
bring up typically a Microsoft compilers, and then you will have to link in all the libraries specific for the Windows environment to run your calculator on the Windows. All right. You take the executable and you try to run on a Mac. Oh, come on, it will never run. All right. Object files are not compatible. Different platforms have different operating systems, or different, different processors also. Right? So C++ is not platform independent, but Java is. So how does it work though? How is, why is Java so smart? Why can they run a Java program on multiple platforms? Ah, the trick is not to compile it to the object code for a particular microprocessor. So the idea is that when you run a Java program, you compile to some intermediate code only. That's called byte code. Byte code is fake. It's not object code. It's just an intermediate level, not on high level like Java or C++, not on low level for a microprocessor to run, but something in between. It's called byte code. Right? And then on each platform, like on my Windows laptop, maybe on my Macintosh laptop and all that, there's an intermediate translator they will translate a byte code into the underlying processor for you to run. That's why it appears it's platform independent, it's cross-platform. Right? So Java is one of those mainstream languages that compiles your Java program into intermediate code, called byte code. Right? In C++, they will compile directly to the processor's code. That's why it's not platform dependent, independent. Right? So like I said, Java have uh, two types. Uh, these days, people look at applications, standalone applications. You run, maybe you handle your transactions in the bank, maybe you handle, um, yeah, your, your hospital billing, or that you should take your shots or something for, I don't know, for for flu, for, you take your flu shots and all that. That you they use a uh, they use an application and back end to handle this kind of uh, scenario. Right? Uh, not not so not so much about applets. Applets is a Java program, a very small Java program that runs within your browser environment. That's called an applet. Okay. In this course, we don't be, won't be running any, any applet. Right. So what are computers? Of course, we know computers. They're tools. We program them to perform many, many functions, uh, from spreadsheets, databases, web processors. These are boring stuff. Uh, most of you are more interested in games, maybe. There's nothing wrong with games, so, that you, you, so long as you control your amount of time spent on games and all that. All right. So programs is basically a set of instructions to explain to the computer what the computer should be doing, right? So they tell you uh, all these kind of uh, aspects of programming. So basically when you do programming, you tell us the flow of the instructions, step by steps. So you do addition, you present the data to your monitor, maybe you send some bytes to a printer to print out, etc. Those are the flow of the instructions, right? Uh, it might be used for mathematical procedures, maybe you're doing uh, some math, solving some math programs. Uh, there, there are many aspects of a computer program. Right? So we, when you look at computer, look at two aspects. Well, the term we use is called hardware and software. So, um, so let me give you an example. Then you know why sometimes you want to know whether the problem or the issues you're facing is hardware or software problem. Right? So I was traveling, and I went to see my father uh, last week, and um, there's something wrong with my phone, all right? So I was walking in the street, and the phone boots itself. So he it, it, said, so I, I want to boot myself. So it starts booting, and it, it does not boot into Android. After, after sometimes it, it runs, uh, Android for a little while, and then it boots itself again. This is called uh, boot loop, boot looping, all right? Now then, if you see a boot looping, you ask yourself, is this a software problem? It's a hardware problem. If it's a software problem, maybe I download another program replacing the operating system, my phone will be working again. Make sense, right? Or if it's a hardware problem, there's nothing I can do. Maybe there's a crack on my circuit board. Maybe there's something wrong with, this, with, with my lab, with my cell phone. Then no matter what I do, it won't be working again. Make sense, right? So sometimes you want to know whether the problem is a hardware problem or whether it's a software problem. Hardware means the circuit board. Maybe the processor, maybe your components on the phone itself, right? So just to, to tell you, to end my story there, um, boot looping is a hardware problem. Because right? I dropped the phone. So I was looking at, I was in the street, right? I dropped the phone, and after two hours, it started boot looping. 
Let's see. I think one of the there's a crack on the on the processors lead to something like that. So they cannot they cannot send a signal to one of the cores in the processor. This is a hardware problem. So I try many things. And uh, by the way, one thing I can test is a hardware problem. Uh, is that I put my cell phone in my freezer. So you must be crazy. Why you put your cell phone in the freezer? The freezer is cold, right? So everything contracts. So the crack actually touch. So the phone works again. But once I take the phone out of my freezer, after half an hour, it starts loop, loop, looping again. So I said, this is the end of my phone. Right. So I have a new phone now in my pocket. So I protect my pocket. I don't want to drop it anymore. All right. Make sense? All right. So, so let's first of all look at the hardware of a computer then. So a little diagram will show you what a computer will look like. Huh? The brain of a computer is called a CPU, Central Processing Unit. Right? So CPU actually has two parts. One part they only do logic, logical thinking. We call them arithmetical logic unit or ALU. They don't show you here. There's a second part, it's on timing. How it is where they create a heartbeat. All right? So you know like a person, I don't know if you know your heart's beating all the time. You probably know, right? Since birth. If your heart says, ah, I'm not going to beat anymore, you die, right? Same for computer too, but the computer has a control unit. It runs on a clock. You look, they, they run very fast, right? How many times does your heart beat in, in one minute? Uh, sorry? 60, right? If I scare you, you might, you might run faster, right? So 6 is really good, you may be an athlete of some sort. Of old folks like me, maybe run with 100 beats per minute or something like that, right? Computer's heartbeat is much faster. They measure in gigahertz. So in one second, they run one gigahertz times, right? 10 to 9 times. Does it make sense? Yeah, so that, that's, that's pretty fast. Makes sense, right? But actually, the computer doesn't run that fast, but it doesn't matter. So they run a clock. So this is what the uh, CPU is doing. They run a clock. So every heartbeat they do, they do some things. Maybe I add two numbers. Every, so they, they look at a clock. So high, low, high, low, right? So uh, depending on the processor speed, uh, they will tell you how many times they send these pulses per second. All right? And uh, when they see a uh, rising edge on the clock, they do something. Maybe they add two numbers together. Maybe they, uh, maybe they move the, the, the content from one memory location to another memory location. Right? That's what they mean by a uh, CPU. All right? Of course, they have, to, uh, they have no memory, a CPU. For memory, they need to access a memory unit. This is the memory on your computer. How much computer do you have on the laptop these days? Typically? 200 gigabytes. 250 gigabytes. That's your hard disk, right? Oh, yeah. 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 You'll be very rich if you have a laptop with 250 gigabytes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, system memory, right? Okay. So typically maybe f f 4 or 8 gigabytes, right? Yeah. All right. And that's the main memory. That's the RAM. RAM stands for random access memory. All right. And, um, but they, uh, you can put all your program within, with all everything you have within four or eight gigabyte, right? So you go to what called secondary storage. That's your hard disk. Do you guys still use hard disk? Nah, no still use a solid state drive, right? No moving part. So you can drop it, but don't crash. You can drop it if you won't crash your hard disk and all that, right? So when I was uh, your age, we don't have a solid state drive, right? We have a spinning disk, a magnetic disk. Then you magnetic have to pick up the set ones and zeros, right? So uh, it looks like the author still write a little uh, hard drive here, huh? secondary storage here, right? <coughs> Now, computer can be very fast, but it's totally useless unless it interacts with the outside world, right? Otherwise, hey, I don't know what you're thinking, I don't know what you're doing. So you do what we call IOs, input and output devices. Uh, can someone give me some input devices, how you input data to a computer? Keyboard, Keyboard right? Another one is what? A mouse. Makes sense, right? Yeah. Can someone tell me some output devices? Where the computer send information to for display purposes and things like that? Screen, Screen right? The monitor, right? Can someone think of another output device? Printer. Printer. Yeah. Makes sense, right? Sometimes it's all integrated. So you guys play with virtual reality? All right. Some of you might want to buy a little cardboard from Google and you can uh, put your cell phone there, you can look around and you see the, you can visit the museum and all that. In the, in the world of the virtual reality, right? Anyway, those are the, the hardware aspect of a computer, right? So like I mentioned, CPU has two parts, ALU and control unit. 
control unit controls the sequencing of events, and the ALU does the do the actual logic, do the actual logic. But you take the instructions from the input, and then you result you might want to present to the output. Yeah. So we call them I/O, input and output. Right. So CPU actually performs the, the cycle called fetch, decode, and execute. Wow, sounds very fancy in English. All right. They, they ask the, uh, they, they were running a program, so they fetch the next instruction to do. Then they do something called decode. This is done in hardware. So they go, oh, what do you want me to do? Do you want to add two numbers together? Do you want me to move the numbers from one location to another location? That's the decode for the instruction. And finally, you execute it. Right? So the little animation here. CPUs continue to fetch some instructions from the main memory. So when you run a program, you store your program into the main memory, into the RAM. So your hard disk into your 4 gig or 8 gig memory there, right? And then you, this is the fetch in, uh, cycle, and then you decode. So what do you want me to do? So computer actually look at those ones and zeros to decide what you want to do, and then they execute. Right? So it's always a cycle, fetch, decode, and execute cycles. So we just take a look at memory, so that is your 4, uh, four gig or 8 gig. How much memory do you guys have typically on your laptop now? Maybe seems how much do you know how much memory you have? No uh how. -huh. I'll tell you usually four to eight gigabyte these days. So. I'll tell you time has changed though. If you want to know how much memory I have when I was using Apple II, you guys know there's something called Apple II? You you, you see oh, I don't have an Apple II, I have an Apple II clone. Alright. So it's called Pineapple II. <laughs> all right, <laughs> so I'm not making this up, all right? And um, you'll be surprised though. So I think it runs off 48 kilobytes of memory. You heard it right, kilobytes, 48 kilobytes, all right? But remember, I, would, um, I was t telling my father, I really want to run Fortran, a language in my, in my time. I really want to run it. But to run it, I need a language card. Language card cost, I think it's about 500 US dollars. So I almost have to sell my kidney uh, just to get a language card so I can run Fortran compiler. And um, it's, you know how much that memory card, how much memory has on that memory card? 16 kilobytes. I'm not, I'm not making this up. <laughs> 16 kilobytes, all right. And uh, it costs you, I think, $500 <coughs> or a left kidney, one of the two. It's either kidney or 500 US dollars or something like that. All right. No, I didn't sell my kidney. So I still have one. No, 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 I see your two, not one. <laughs> anyway, so things change a lot, right? So uh, these days I'll tell you, your program is so huge compared to what we used to when we were learning programming in, in, in our time. Thank you. All right. So um, anyway, so uh, I want to tell you how they organize the RAM though. Remember RAM stands for random access memory? So why random access compared to what? He says something not so random. Yeah, there's something called sequential access. All right. Sequential access means when I access the information, I access them in in a serial order. Right. Like what? Why would you do that? A tape. If you look at magnetic tape, they they access information in sequ in sequential order. That's like sequential uh, access, right? But when memory is different, right? I go to this place to look at some data. I go there, so it's random access. Right? The system memory is, is RAM, random access, not sequential access, right? But sometimes you back up the data on a, on a magnetic tape, there's a sequential access there, right? All right. RAM is divided into units called bytes. The minimum units of measurement in, on a computer is not an atom, all right? So in the, in the world, in the physical world, that might be an atom, or you may add only subatomic particles, no, no. So okay, on a, a sim simplistic level, the minimum units that we look at in the physical world is like an atom. In biology, that would be what? A cell. Make sense, right? In computer, that would be what? A byte. A byte is a minimum unit that you work with. So it shouldn't be a bit. No, usually a byte. Why? A byte has an address. All right. So I live in a street. I live in an address called 1800 Fox Spring Circle. I make it up. I don't live there. All right. And uh, that's my address. All right. In the computer, in the memory, Things have an address too, all right. Those, at, but the minimum unit that have an address is called a uh, is called a byte. Does that make sense, right? But within the byte, they actually bits though. But they don't have an individual address. It's like they live in the same house, 
but then we have this little, you, you leave a little room within your house there. All right? And bytes is the minimum unit of an address there. Make sense? All right. So RAM is divided up into units called bytes, uh, and bytes consists of eight bits. That's uh, by definition. So this is what it looks like. Right? So these are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bits. Together we call it a, a byte. All right? Now this is very strange. It also shows you a byte, it's like my hardware. And there's a switch, as you can turn it. One, zero, one, you can switch it on and off, right? Do you really think a computer works like this? Not anymore. Oh, really? Was there a time a computer looks like this? Yes. When I was learning programming, I literally go to a computer room, there's a computer, I can flip the bits on a byte. It's crazy. But you can do that in those days, all right? So I used to work on uh, PTP 11 or VAX computers. You literally can see your bytes with a little LED light and all this show you. Well, not anymore, this is conceptual, all right? So bytes is either on or off, right? So I want you to, a lot of people say, oh, I feel uncomfortable. I don't know what is on, what is off and all that, right? Under the cover, I'll tell you, each bit is actually represented as a transistor. So uh, we won't do a circuit here. So actually, that's my background. I can tell you they use a transistor to represent a bit. So when it's on high voltage, we call them one. It's low voltage, we call them zero. All right. Why do we use binary? Is there advantage to do more than binary arithmetic? Can we do tri-level logic, for example? All right. All right. So um, there are people who are trying to who are trying to. Uh, Give us the notion of multiple level logic too. Those are like research topics. We won't of course talk about this in the class, right? So uh, there are people who try to do tri-level logic actually. But trust me, it's a waste of time. In, in, at least in our lifetime, all right? I don't think it's going to pan out. Anyway, so for computers, uh, each bit can be either a zero or a one, all right? So like I said, usually. Uh, high voltage is represented as maybe a one, and low low, low voltage is used, used to represent a value of zero. Right? Right. And um, so you remember, the minimum units of measurement computer is a byte. All right. So each byte is uh, will be assigned an address, like I mentioned. Right. Uh, one thing you should understand, though, memory is volatile. What do they mean? Well, the, 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 the stock market is volatile. So what, what do you mean by volatile? They mean it changes all the time. Right? But in this case, when they say memory is volatile, that means that when you turn off the power to my laptop, all the information that I've been storing on my 4 gig or 8 gigabytes memory is gone. We cannot rely on them anymore. All right? RAM's memory's content is volatile. All right? But not your hard disk, though. Thank goodness. Do you think when, when, when Wells Fargo turn off the computer in the morning, your bank account is gone? Then there will be a riot in the street, right? So they, they do not, hopefully, I hope they don't, hopefully, they don't store your bank account information in memory, right? Does that make sense? All right. Actually, that's not the case. Oh, you'll be surprised, all right? I want to tell you, there are some products in the industry, they, do, they only store the system record in memory, but they, have, they run multiple copies of that. They guarantee that at no time will there be all copies shutting down at the same time. Then you can actually store your bank records if you want to in memory. That's a product called coherence. They do just that. All right. But it goes way beyond regular programming. I want to tell you, usually the concept is that, oh, stuff you store in memory, they are volatile. So you turn off computer gone, right? So you don't store bank records. You don't store your, your hospital visit records in, in memory only. You will store them on something that's permanent, right? So what, what is that that's permanent? Usually a hard disk, maybe a solid state drive. Solid state drive are not RAMs. They maintain the information even though you turn off the power. Make sense, right? It's either magnetic medium usually in the past, or maybe these days we use maybe solid state drive also. Right. That's the meaning here. All right. So I want to show you, what, so we're still on the subject of hardware. So these are different addresses. So addresses are called 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So it's like the street number, 1800 Fox Spring Circle. Right, I'm making that, some, some, some street name or something like that. So each of these is a what? Is a byte. All right? So we can put stuff inside the house then, right? So a section of memory is called a byte. 
How many pieces do they have for that? Eight. Eight, right? So I buy it's made of eight bits. Each bit can either be zero or one. You literally can see it, all right, on, on, a, uh, on your memory chip. And a section of two or four bytes is used to call a word. So the author is not quite sure what is a word. It's not, it's not a precise definition. But actually, in, um, uh, in different computer languages, uh, sometimes it's even platform dependent. Right? So uh, maybe two, maybe four, we call it a word also. Easier to handle. So that's about uh, RAM, random access memory. What about secondary storage? Like I mentioned, this is where they store your bank accounts, your hospital records and all that, right? They are non-volatile. That's good though, right? Oh, hey, I thought I store, I say a thousand dollars in my savings, and I'm, nah, it's only in memory. That, that's not good, right? So they store them in non-volatile memory, right? So that might be your source state drive, that might be your magnetic disk drive. Uh, maybe your CD-ROMs, maybe your DVD-ROM drive. And you guys know what a DVD is? So a lot of people say, I just stream movies. I don't even know what a DVD is anymore. This kind of scares me, right? All right. You guys know what a DVD is, right? All right. USB drive. All right. All right. So those are about the memory. All right. Volatile memory and non-volatile memory, right? IOs. You mentioned uh, uh, some of Apple devices like keyboard, like a mouse. You, you guys watch one of those uh, episodes in Star Trek? So I think the uh, I think it was Spock who picked up a mouse, who doesn't know what it is, and he starts talking into the mouse. Right? He, doesn't know, he doesn't seen a mouse before, right? Things change, right? So maybe 20 years ago, we don't even know what a mouse is. Maybe 20 years later, we don't know what a mouse is anymore. Also, it depends on the, the state of art at that time. All right. Output is when the, when the computer sends the data to, Maybe on a monitor, maybe on a printer, and those are output devices. Right? Computers are useless unless they communicate with the outside world, right? So you can do quite crank all the numbers you want unless you communicate with the human world. It's not quite useful, right? And unless, of course, the computers run the world. <coughs> that would be a scary thought. Somehow. All right, so that's about hardware. We are not here for hardware. In fact, that's the discussion of hardware for the rest of the course already, right? <laughs> We look at software, right? So there are two kinds, uh, two large classifications of software, OS and application software, right? OS is your, is the environment under which you do things, right? It's, it's actually in, uh, in, in charge of how to schedule things that a computer should be doing, right? So the modern operating systems are usually multitasking. They allow multiple tasks to be running at the same time, right? So the, uh, of course, everyone knows the uh, popular operating systems. Uh, in fact, my favorite is actually Linux. Most of the time I use Linux operating system. And um, some of you, if you're running a Mac computer, you're running Mac OS. If you're running uh, Windows, uh, I mean, Windows 10, you of course, you would in a Windows family. Right? Uh, Linux is, uh, was basically a uh, close cousin of Unix operating system. Right? So uh, we, we, I think we mentioned already, uh, in addition to operating systems, uh, we, by the way, we won't be doing any operating system work here. So we'll be uh, thinking about application software, and we shall be using Java to write our programs uh, for something called application software, like spreadsheets, web processors, or whatever utility programs you have to write, including games, right? So computer language is a special uh, language used to uh, write computer programs and uh, I think they give uh, and uh, usually you have to come up with the algorithm so your approach is how you solve a problem and um, the computer needs the algorithm to be written in a, uh, in a machine language computers are, they actually do not understand Java directly they do not understand C++ they don't understand Python directly so those languages have either to be compiled or have to be interpreted, there are two terms here, compiled or interpreted on to the level of the machine lang language level before the process understands well, what do you want me to do for you, all right? So uh, machine language is very difficult, right? Basically, you work with binary numbers. Imagine you're flipping those switches, which we just show you, to test your program, and come on, no one can write like this anymore. At least no humans can write like this anymore, right? So, um, so you, you, uh, so you, Humans are closer to a high-level language. 
like C++ or Java or Python. So we work on that level, and then we translate all the instructions ultimately to machine language level. Right. To show you a few, uh, a few programming languages, they show you what a lo uh, machine language instruction will look like. Really, just a bunch of ones and zeros. Huh? And uh, they talk about uh, different CPUs here. This is actually very old. Motorola 68000 is a very old uh, processor, but they, 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 they're sort of don't you, don't yell me if you're playing for Motorola, all right? They're basically irrelevant in the industry right now, right? These really have, if you're looking at server or, or laptops, of course you look at the Intel family, right? If you're looking at cell phone, then you want the ARM processors. Right? What's the big difference between them? Uh, power consumption, right? So it's, wow, my cell phone runs so fast. Well, but the battery will last half an hour. Will you be happy? No, I won't be very happy, right? That's the problem with Intel processors. All right, they are they are they are not they don't have an eye on the performance of, of the power <coughs> performance of the of the chip, so they never get a foothold into the cell phone market, right? So it's up to maybe Qualcomm and other maybe Samsung to uh, to to own the uh, the uh, cell phone processor family, right? So the processor on a cell phone is very different than a processor on a laptop. All right, one is this is designed more for performance, right? And for a cell phone, it's more designed for for power, power consumption. Does it make sense, right? Of course, there are some gray area also. I do know that some of the cell phones run Intel processors too, but not common, very rare actually. All right. All right. So let's look at different assembly, uh, different programming languages. All right. So ultimately, a processor needs machine language to run, but it's very difficult to write machine languages, right? So one of the early attempts is to write something called assembler. Assembler is sort of like a sort of like a mnemonic for machine code. So I don't think they have an example. These are this is actually very difficult to read still, right? So so um, they make things easier but still uh, highly dependent on the processor and difficult to write this kind of program. So then uh, developers venture into what the high level languages in the last few decades. Alright. So this this uh, this course is all about Java the most popular languages in the industry right now. And frankly, other than Python, uh, is also considered quite easy to learn. To. Well, I shouldn't say that basic is also quite easy to learn. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about this kind of language as well. Uh, basic is, um, I think it's what Bill Gates programming. Bill Gates wrote the basic interpreter, right? Not that if you do basic, you become a billionaire. It won't be the case anymore, <laughs> right? And uh, COBOL is for business applications. Pascal is a wonderful language, extremely nice. Somehow didn't pick up. And in fact, uh, Pascal was subsequently developed into something called ADA. ADA is the language used for the military. So you want to design the trajectories of the missiles, you write in ADA. Believe, believe me, right? how can you find ADA developers these days? Right? I don't know how the the defense industry can hire anyone who claims they know ADA. No one writes in Pascal, no one writes in ADA anymore. But when you look for a job in defense industry, sometimes I ask, do you know ADA? I say, why am I learning ADA in the, in the year 2017, right? But that's the uh, variant from uh, Pascal, I think, all right? in case you're wondering. All right? These are close family, these are cousins, and you're kind of a... Uh, yeah, C sharp also, huh? That's true. C sharp is closer to Java than to C plus plus actually, right? Yeah. And um, uh, there are other languages maybe more on the user, more on the graph, uh, the the, uh, the front end on maybe the web pages. So some, uh, languages like PHP, Ruby, these are more for the web design also, right? And I think some of you mentioned about JavaScript. JavaScript is actually very popular. All right, this is close to Java, but it's not not really a uh, compiled language also. So, so Python is actually very popular also right, among uh, people who want to do programming uh, for the first time. Right? So among all these high-level languages, things are there are th something that are in common. All right. So uh, in general, they all have these kinds of a keywords, operators, punctuation, identifiers, and syntactic rules. Right? So we'll go through what they mean by uh, by this kind of high-level language. Right. They always have keywords. Let me see. Uh, maybe a little program. This is a Java program. 
In case you've never seen a Java program before, maybe this is uh, the, the, the first program you will look at. Huh? It's called Hello World. All high-level languages, the first program you write is called Hello World. Why? I don't know. You're introducing yourself to the world, all right? So, uh, uh, so the, uh, in a nutshell, public, this kind of words, static, class, these are what we call keywords, all right? Keywords, any high-level language of keywords, those are forbidden words to use. If you want to name a variable with that name, public note is not allowed because they have special meaning. All right. So keywords are usually lowercase. All right. Lowercase are keywords. They are forbidden words to be used as the name of your variables. All right. So uh, and this is called a class name. Now Java is uh, very strange compared to C plus plus. In Java, anything must be part of a class including the all-important main function. Your world starts at main function. So you're running your operating system. The operating system wants to run its Java program. They come down here. The first thing it does, you look for the main function. All right. This is the first function they will call. This is the starting point of your Java program. All right. They run here. And of course, I won't explain the details yet. I just want to tell you, they're just writing the message called Hello World to the console. All right. So they, you'll see Hello World on your terminal. So um, out is actually an object, all right? So remember I mentioned briefly about object-oriented programming? So you, you enrich, you give the knowledge, you give the sort of like information to an object and ask object, you handle this. Basically tell you, well, can you, can you write something to a terminal? You know what to do, so you handle it. So I don't have to go to all the details about how to write something to the terminal, to the, the computer monitor. So I simply ask them, the old out object, can you do a print for this message called Hello World to the terminal there? You take care of the rest for me. All right. And uh, notice that it's called print line. That means after they write this to the terminal, they move the, so they, they print this one, H-E-L-L-O space, double O-L-L-D. Usually the cursor stays here. But because of the print line here, this cursor moves to the next line getting ready to print out the next character. So in a nutshell, this is what this program is doing. All right. So like I said, in the last program here, you see a bunch of keywords. Keywords are always lowercase in Java, same in C++. All right. And uh, Git cannot be used as your identifier. You should use identifier to define a name for your variable and things like that. Programming languages also have, uh, have concepts of um, some kind of punctuations. All right. So in Java programming, if you look at this, you notice that they end each statement with a semicolon, all right, in general. All right. And uh, notice that we don't call this a line. Because I can write like this, string message equals, then move to the next line and write hello world. All right. Then there are one, two, three lines there, but really two statements. All right. So we say that the semicolon is what, set to, is what we use to delineate a statement, not a line. Right. So semicolons are used to end statements. Uh, not all lines of a Java program end a statement. It's, it's quite common. Each statement should have a semicolon at the end of the line. Right. Uh, so uh, some of part of learning of Java is learn where to properly use the punctuation. You, you get to use this. Uh, you, you, get to under, you, you will understand this very soon as you start writing your Java program. And then let me tell you the difference between a line against a statement. These are two lines here, but it's one statement. Huh? Okay. Another thing you should know is that the space has no meaning. See a space here? Maybe a bunch of blank spaces here and all that. Right? No meaning in Java. All right? uh, but it, it does have meaning in Python. Python, right? Yeah. So be careful when you do Python. I think Python uses the level of indentation to define the body of a loop and all that, right? It's very dangerous, right? Some people, they do Python programming in the, in the beginning. They do not know there's a difference between using a space bar and a tab key. Exciting things will happen to you. You mix up the, the space bars and the tab key, right? Because they're not the same, same indentation level. Make sense to you? All right. So at my age, exciting things are bad. So when I say it's exciting, then it's bad. Right? So it's really exciting to you to learn Python and not know the difference between tab and the space bar. No, no problem in Java, no problem in C++. 
they consider this, all this, they call them white space. They're just some space there. They carry no meaning in that language at all. all right. So when you run a uh, write a Java program, uh, you you store the data in what, in the memory, right? In the RAM, right? And uh, so you will define variables to store those uh, content that you want to work with, right? So this is a good example about how to uh, how you declare uh, a variable so you can store some integer content there. All right. So here we have a um, we have a uh, a variable called hours. Remember I mentioned about the, uh, the keyword? You cannot call it beans public equals 40. Remember? Because public is a keyword. So that, that's, that's forbidden. You cannot say beans uh, public equals Because public is a keyword. Right? But you can call it hours, minutes, whatever you want. Fair enough? All right. Uh, also, you notice that, wait a minute, what's ins? What does ins stand for? Ah, for th these are called primitive data types. So whenever you create a, a, a some something to store some you create a variable to store something there, you tell so what kind of information do you intend to store inside such a variable? So this is called int, which stands for integer. So I'm going to store an integer there. So 40 is an integer, minus 3 is an integer. Is 23.6 an integer? Nah. Then you cannot say int hours equals to 23.6. Make sense, right? What about 23.0? Is it an integer? Nah, that's not an integer too, right? So you have to tell us, I'm going, you have to do what you claim you're doing, right? You're not hypocritic or something like that, right? You say, I'm going to store integer, so I will declare variable to store instead, right? So what do we mean? What does it mean when we really say ours is an integer variable and put 40 there? Oh, by the way, one thing I should mention is that how do we read this statement? Some people say, oh, ins, hours equals to 40, maybe. It's probably better to read this as, I'm going to create ins variable called hours, and let me assign a value 40 to this variable. Does that make sense, right? Yeah, so it is, a lot of times this is considered an assignment statement. Right? In fact, in some programming languages, they are so picky. They really want to know that this doesn't mean that hours equals to 40. This means I'm assigning 40 into this variable, overwriting whatever it was there before. There's a difference here. Let me show you. So what hours used to carry content of 600 is int variable. All right. When I, when I do this, hours 40, that means I'm bringing a variable 40. Let me replace this variable 40. Right. I don't mean hours equals to 40. I mean replace the content of hours with the content of 40 there. Make sense, right? This is really an assignment statement. I'm assigning this value to this variable, replacing the original value there. Make sense? All right. See the difference there? All right. So what if I want to compare? Does our contains 40? Then you would do, like I suppose, we will do it uh, next week. If hours equals to 40, you actually write like this, equals equals 40. All right? If it equals to 40, then you do something here. That's a conditional statement. Right? Not yet. We won't look at this yet. So I want to tell you, the meaning of this is not com uh, this equals to 40. It means I'm assigning this value to a variable called hours there. All right? So let's see what it really means there. Remember, we look at the RAM. Those addresses, right? So of course. Oh, by the way, oh, I, I, I did mention. The author does not talk about this too. What what's funny number C O X here? What C O X? Yes. Hexadecimal. Yeah, hexadecimal. All right. That means address is like this: zero, 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 one, zero, zero, two, zero, zero, three, all the way to zero, zero, seven. What's the next one? Zero, zero, eight, right? And then zero, zero, nine. What's the next one under zero, zero, nine? Yeah, C O C O A. A means ten. All right. What's the next one? B. C O C O C C O C O D C O C O E and then C O C O F. What's the next one? Zero one zero. Yeah, C O one zero. So so, so it looks like they have sixteen digits here. When you run out, then they go to the next digit. Does it make sense, right? So yes, I I'm not used to the. Of course not. You have ten fingers, right? You have sixteen fingers. How many of you have sixteen fingers? 
Maybe you do, I don't. All right? So that's why we're not used to this, right? But if you, if you have 16 fingers, you yeah, it's very natural. <laughs> the world should run from C to F and then to C again. Does that make sense, right? So I do know people who have uh, you know, 16 fingers, right? At least in the head. So they can do this kind of thing, right? Fair enough, right? So that, the, the, the destination of COX means that all those digits are hexadecimal digits. Does that make sense, right? So uh, computers, hexadecimal numbers are very close to binary numbers, right? That's why they like to label the addresses with hexadecimal numbers, right? All right. So, uh, so what, do we, what do they mean here? When they say ins length equals 72, they give a name to your, to your memory location. Computer decides, I'm going to put 72 here. All right. So in other words, length is a nickname for that address, the memory address though, right? So for example, remember I live in a place called 1800 Fox Spring Circles? It's not true, I make it up, all right? So then on your, on your, on your notebook, you say, oh, mm, tag Q, my name, tag Q's address. So, if, uh, so tag Q, so instead of remembering 1800, those funny numbers, let's just, let's just put a little nickname. So that is tag Q's address. Make sense, right? So length is a alias, I think that we call it alias. Uh, it's an alias for this location, of course, called, uh, and we were going to put the corner 72 in this location. Right? But wait, hold on, wait a minute. How many bytes do we have here? Eight. Sorry, how many bits do we have? Uh, one, eight bits, right? How, can, how many, what, what value can you store with eight bits only? The character? Uh, small, only up to 256, right? It's a small value. For those of you who don't know, how do I know that? It's okay. I, I, do play this a lot, but I will tell you if you only store a number, uh, you're right, a character. So like eight bits here, you can only store a value from between zero to two hundred fifty-five only. All right. So uh, so that's not what we. Sometimes I want to store a large integer, right? So in Java, they actually will take four bytes and call this one int. Does it make sense? One more time. All right. Is all oh, to do. So, so, Storing central is okay, it's still less than 255. But what if I want to store a large number, right? In Java, when you say length is an int, that means they take up four bytes and call this whole thing. Thing is a technical term. They call this thing an int. That's what they meant. If you tell me the data type, I know how many bytes I put together to store your value of 72. Fair enough? All right. Don't worry, you have so much memory, it's nothing. Or you don't live in the, in the 80s or something, where so you have to sell your kidney for your um, 16 kilobyte uh, language card. So you can look, look it up on Google, and you can see a language card from Apple II costing you hundreds of dollars, maybe more than, maybe close to a thousand dollars, just for 16 kilobytes of memory in those days. So then you worry about things like that. No, not anymore. This is one int. Does that make sense? All right. Let's erase it. So that was, that's what they meant when you declare a variable called length, all right? Oops. All right. So Java virtual machines will decide where the value is placed. It's none of your business. You declare a variable here, you use it. You don't care where it is within your actual memory location, all right? That's a nice thing about a uh, high-level language. All right, so programmers will write Java, write Java programs, and uh, they will call them source code. That's your job. That's your homework. That's your test, etc. right? You write source code. All right, so uh, you, you need a text editor to edit and save the source code file. Can you use a word processor? So I like my Microsoft Word, I, I like the Office or whatever, right? No, what's the problem? They can't read it. Yeah, why can't they read it? Because when you write a word, when you create a word processor file, although you write down your diary and things like that, they will, there are a lot of hidden characters there. They will remember your font size, your background color, etc. Right? So your file, what you look at is not the actual content of the file. There are a lot of metadata there. All right? So you want a clean text editor. They don't store any extra junk in your file. So you don't use a regular word processor to write a program. You must use a text editor. It's a source code editor. All right? And just step number one. And next, you need to compile it. You need to translate your high-level Java program into, like I mentioned, bytecode. And this is your intermediate code, which then is platform 
independent, you can run it on a PC, you can run it on a Mac, you can run it on a Linux environment. So you need a compiler. And by the way, that's the difference between Python and Java. Java has to be compiled before you run it. Not Python, right? This, uh, in, Python is just an interpreter language. Right? Uh, you, you will have errors when you first write your program. You fix your errors. Those are called syntax errors, grammatical errors. Right? Most compilers translate source code into executables directly, calling machine code. But Java only can translate into bytes code, intermediate code, like I mentioned. So it allows your Java program to be running on multiple platforms. And uh, byte code instructions are the machine language of a JVM. This is a fake processor. So uh, it, when you look at some microsystem specification, they pretend in this world there's a microprocessor called a JVM, Java Virtual Machine. Let's just run my program and compile into this fake CPU's machine code. Now, everywhere on a Mac, on a PC, on a Linux laptop, I'm going to give you a very short, very thin translation layer. They understand spike code, they can immediately run your spike code into machine code. That layer is called a Java virtual machine. That's why they give you platform independence uh, using uh, Java as a language. By course, uh, if you look at this file, uh, you can see the file end with a dot class file. Uh, JVM is a program emulating fictitiously uh, a microprocessor. JVM executes instructions as they are read. We call JVM itself to be an interpreter. But this is a very high performing, high, very high performance interpreter. So uh, it's arguable. Some people call it a, therefore, Java is an interpreter language. So you like to think it's actually an interpreter language with the performance of a compiled language, all right? So I want to tell you a little bit about performance then, all right? If you guys want to do uh, Cortex programming, all right? Notice that if you write your solutions in Java, they give you two seconds to finish your program. So you write a program, you submit it to a judge, the computer judge runs the program, it allows you two seconds to finish your program. In C++, it allows you one second. Because C++ is a more efficient language compared to Java. So they said, yeah, maybe the program is slower, so to be fair, I'll give you two seconds to run the program. All right. uh, what about J uh, Python? Also two seconds. They think Java and Python is about the same performance, actually. Right. Uh, actually, Java is, might be uh, faster than Python. All right. Anyway, this is your overall uh, environment uh, for, for, for any programming classes. So you use text editor to write your program. In Java, that will be taught .java. You compile it. You read by compiler, compile in a class file. And then you run your JVM, Java Virtual Machine, an interpreter. And then you run your program on your process, on your on the particular platform. All, right. All this is done within the ID environment. That makes it so your life so much easier. All right. All right. Anyway, JVM exists on many platforms. Uh, I, I run three platforms at home. I have installed JVM both on Linux, Mac, and Windows also. Now, these are not so common anymore. This is also a uh, Linux, uh, Unix environment, BSD. Berkeley, from uh, UC Berkeley. All right, and uh, I think, uh, yeah, you see that we have the same bytes code. So it's very nice. You can work on your program on your Windows laptop. You give me your program, I can write on my MacBook. That's how nice it is, all right? Uh, because it's the same class file, but on each operating system, we run the own virtual machines, which then translate that into high-performing, low-level machine code. All right. So uh, anyway, so uh, today I do want you guys to uh, to do a, a installation on the uh, ID environment. All right. So they go through a process with you. But if you do not use the ID environment, this is what you would do. You write your, your Java program, you run your compiler. This is your, sorry, this is not compiler. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a typo, it is horrible. I don't have some office to type this Java C. I'm very sorry. You run a Java C compiler. I'm surprised the slide has errors actually. All right. uh, this is correct. You run Java C on the Java program, All right. and that will create a class file. All right. I'm very surprised. Right. You need a Java C compiler, and then um, yeah. So so there are two steps actually. You have a program, 
you write a program like filename.java, like payroll.java, run Java C compiler, they will then create a file called payroll.class file. All right. How do you run this program? Well, you, move, you can move it to your Mac, your PC, your Linux laptop, and what you do is write Java, that's to invoke the interpreter, and you just specify the name of the class file, payroll. You don't have to specify .class, just the name of the class file that will run the program. Okay. So this steps for compilation, this step for executable of your JV, Java virtual machine. All right. Any questions, anyone? Hope that makes sense to you folks. All right. So they give you the process. Yes, I think this is good enough or already for us. Uh, the author now wants to tell us the differences between procedural and object-oriented programming. I think I mentioned this briefly this afternoon. Procedural languages is something you tell us all the steps, right? <laughs> step by steps in all details, right? So you work with data elements, uh, like function calls, when you call another functions, etc. You are in complete control. But very elaborate, you can use this approach to, to develop large software, right? Last uh, two decades, people are now doing OOP, object oriented programming. Good example, like, like a chess program. You explain to each chess piece, uh, each chess pieces, you are a pawn, you move one step at a time, you are a knight, you move this, you are a, you are a castle, you move in, in certain ways and all that. You give that object their own intelligence. Whenever need to, you ask the piece, move, move yourself. They know how to move themselves, right? That's called object oriented programming. All right. So objects they have attributes. In a chessboard, the chess piece, the attribute with the locations where the chess piece is. And they also have methods, the behavior. They know how to move itself. So it's just when the time comes, I explain to a chess piece, you move for you, you know the rules of yourself. Right? That's called object-oriented programming. Very, high, very abstract at this point. Don't worry, we will cover this in gory details in the future. All right. Anyway, that's object-oriented programming. Uh, that will wrap up our first discussion. Today I want to go through two presentations. I think you guys deserve a, a break then, right? So maybe a little break here. All right? Maybe you guys you want to use get some water or use a restroom or something. You don't have to, but you want to get some water. You guys have any questions for me? So we'll, we'll take a short break for five minutes. You can stretch your legs and do whatever you have to. All right? And then we will come back and look at the second presentation today. You know, I'll tell you something that's very nice though. We control the temperature here, do you know that? Behind this lady here is the controller. We can turn this room to, to the temperature of North Pole or, or wherever you want by just changing the temperature if you want. So let me see here, you use a Mac? And you? Windows. Windows, huh? Windows 10? All right. And you use Windows, all right? And that's a Mac. That's a uh, Mac. I see. That's our A space, so that's good. That's a Windows. It's, it's, it's really all annoying. I'm trying to get my mom to think about it. Oh, that's okay. Java does not require a lot of resources to run it. It does not need a lot of resources to run it. 
Yeah. And this is a map. And this, all the more map is winning. Oh, the fruits are, are winning. <laughs> uh, <coughs> do you not like that? I'm, oh, I, it's okay. A bit um, <coughs> it's expensive. Yeah. I have nothing against Apple. It's okay. In Cupertino, you can't say you have anything against Apple. <laughs> Alright, you guys have no questions? Can I continue? I don't want to bore you or I don't want you to drop dead or something like that. It's, it's not good. Right. So actually I have a, quite a bit of jet lag. So if I suddenly die here or drop dead, you know, you guys know too, because I'm like living in a different time zone altogether. Alright, All right, let's look at the... Uh, uh, yeah. I don't think we have enough time to... Uh, to, uh, to, help, to help everyone to download. So before I forget, all right? So when you go home uh, uh, after this class then, uh, can you guys install two things for me? M mostly for those of you who are using the, uh, the MacBook also. Uh, a, uh, unless you have done so already, uh, I want you to install JDK, Java Development Toolkit. And uh, secondly, I want you to uh, install an ID environment. If you have no preference, pick up uh, Eclipse then, all right? But don't worry. If you cannot do it, you don't know what to do, that's perfectly fine. Next week, also bring, if I bring your computer every, every week, all right, I will help you directly. Right? And then I will download the necessary files and all that for you too. But I think in a Mac, don't you have to install something from your App Store? Is that right? Do you guys usually install something from your, from your App Store? Oh, so you do it yourself manually, you don't go through the App Store. All right, that's, that's fine too. Right? So you might want to do a, a bit of uh, googling on the. I will write down. Basically, I want you to install JDK Java Development Toolkit. I think kit or something like that. You call it JDK. The latest version should be version nine. All right. Do it from Oracle. All right. Don't go to some strange website and install some virus or, or something on your computer. Right. Go to Oracle, download the uh, JDK. That's step number one. In step number two, there's something called Eclipse. It's ID environment. So if you have no other preferences, also install Eclipse environment on your on your Macintosh. All right. If you if you need some help, don't don't worry. Bring bring your computer. Your lady first. Um, does like the other like Xcode, for example, does that? Does Xcode do uh, Java development also? <laughs> yeah, usually people use Xcode for C plus plus. Yeah. So, um, uh, maybe hold off on that. Let me check out. Huh? Yeah. And you have a question? Is you going to have, have like an email sent off to like, remind you? Oh, do I have an email to remind you? Or something, something like that, like tell us the homework? Or... Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, I already set up a share disk. Uh, uh, but I did put this in. I, I put in the actual homework. But then I realized that maybe you, you guys, some of you might need some help also, right? So uh, I'll update it. I'll update the document. Right. Basically, these two things are extra. You have to do this before you can actually do some programming, obviously. Okay. So, um, uh, I don't know if your parents can help. Uh, it depends, right? But uh, let's not rely on that. So, if you need have their help, make sure you bring your laptop in and I will help you next time on the installation of such, right? Because uh, this is a uh, equally long module, so we might run out of time. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, Pineapple. All right. So that's not my uh, my, my computer before. Then, huh? All right. So uh, here we look at some actual concepts. Now, so in the last module we put Java as a language and explain to you the role of Java in the in our context, right? So now we know it's a high level language. It's platform independent. We use it to control the operations on a on a computer, right? So that that's what you need to get. So this little chapter here, we will go through how you define variables. We'll, we'll tell you what are primitive data types. We'll tell you some operators. We'll look at some kind of a uh, uh, combined assignment operators. Uh, we'll look at a lot, a lot of stuff. Strings, scoping, comments, programming styles, scanners. Even a little dialog box too. All right. So uh, quite a lot of stuff. All right. So, um, all right. so uh, before we start everything, I want to tell you that when you write a Java program, Remember, everything you write must belong to some class. Uh, we have not talked about what class is, we will in the future. But for now, I want to tell you, when you write a class, 
suppose the name of a class is called simple, then you must put that class into a file called simple.java. So it's kind of unusual that they force you that to have the file name that carries the class name. All right. So must if it's, if your class is called simple, the file must be called simple.java. Right. The second rule to remember is that in Java is a very good convention that class name should be uppercase. It's actually you can actually write as a lower case, but it's a very poor design. All right. So it's universally accepted that when you write a Java class, the class name is simple. I mean, not the class, but it's uppercase. All right. Uh, uh, this is not the rule for C++ though. Some of you do C++ as so what the, I use a lowercase class all the time, right? In fact, a lot of system classes in C++ are with a lowercase, which is kind of very strange if you come from a Java background. In Java background, you're so used to the fact that any class starts with an uppercase, and the objects, any user-defined variables start with lowercase. So immediately you can tell the, the, the purpose of that variable, or that name, all right? So, uh, so the author, oh, by the way, for all the slides here, the author tells you, or see an example like this, right? So, um, I can set up correctly. In theory, I should be able to click on this file to show you the file like this, right? I don't have it. So what I did is I actually cut and paste it in, uh, in my environment. So maybe I'll show you folks about my programming environment. My Eclipse is here. Uh, I, I'm using a version called Oxygen, the latest version of Eclipse, all right? Oh, that's too small for you guys to read. Can you guys read this? Mm -hmm. You can. Well, you have supervision. Uh, can you guys read? You can. You can too. Impossible. I cannot read. But anyway, you can read. So I don't have to change font. Nah, i will be nice for change. Usually people tell me I'm such a nasty person. So do a be nice for change. Right. Let me change the font size. Oh, that's my background. No, not really. <laughs> I wish. Let me change the settings. Uh, 125%, 50%. So this is, again, this is an oxygen environment, maybe better. Uh, so a few things I want to show you. So suppose I, I uh, want to write a program here. Huh? So uh, let, me, let me give you one example. Or maybe this is, this is a good example. So uh, there's a class is called uh, the class is called do you see payroll dialog do you see that all right so so um, you'll know better in the future I'll show you in the future but for now suppose I wanted to create a class called uh, I know a demo all right so this is what I would do I would go to um, uh, I would right click on the uh, source. In this case, I have something called a package. I've not shown you any of this yet. All right. So maybe I go to here. I right click and say new a class. So I make it up. I call it demo. The simplest kind of a uh, Java class. Then, all right. So uh, in Eclipse, they're actually very nice. They offer a lot of uh, features for you. Uh, so for example, one thing they can do is like remember every Java class start with a function called main. You say, why don't you give me a fake main, an empty main there? So that's why I click check the checkbox here. So yeah, give me a main here. So this is the world's simplest Java program, all right? Uh, ignore the statement called package. We're not using package for a few weeks. Uh, just look at the class there. Remember the class is called public class, and uh, I'll use an uppercase D for demo, all right? And everything starts here. So when the operating system transfer control to this program, they run the first line in this program here. Uh, the first line here is actually a comment. I know nothing to execute here. So let me write something meaningful then. Maybe I simply ask them, can you do a system dot out dot print line? Let me do a hello world. All right. At the end, remember you end a statement with a semicolon, right? You notice that. They are very. They are kind of like uh, your parents. Uh, they, they bug you all the time. Now you said they give you a little red X here. Nah, nah, nah. Something is not right. All right. What's not right is that in this statement here, I forgot to put semicolon there. Do you see that? All right. So, uh, so I put a semicolon there. So they, they are happy now. They, the, the red X disappear. Can you see that? Right. So do you like this? I don't know. 
This is almost like someone's watching you. <laughs> it's like a big brother watching you all the time, right? So if you want some help, initially it's good. They help you to fix your grammar and all. Alright? So this is the program already. Alright? So do you notice that lots of spaces here? It doesn't matter, right? One thing you can do, I can remove them. Suppose I'm not a very tidy person. Suppose I, I don't know why. I, I put a lot of maybe tabs here. It's kind of ugly, alright? But in Eclipse, one thing that's very nice, you can right click on the source code and say, can you do a you see a source here? Can you do a format for me? All right. So we do a format here. You see that they move everything back in place? They actually format it nicely for your source code for you too. All right. So when you're ready, you want to run this program, you just go up here and you click this one button here. It's like a, a play button. All right. They will do the following. They will compile this program into a class file then you run a Java interpreter on your class file too. So, so I, all I have to do is press the button here, and they run the program. And the output of the program is here, hello world, you see that? That's the output of the program. All right. This is not very impressive, it's just a very simple program. All right. But this, this presentation here, it will show you something a bit more with a common, maybe a user interface there. This is a program where you can see that you, you ask, they are asking them to pop up a little uh, dialog box, they ask you what's my name. My name is John. How many hours did I work this week? I work uh, 20 hours this week. And uh, they are paying me $15 an hour. So they can then calculate, yeah, so your gross pay is $300. Right. So this is more like a modern program and things like that, right? But all you can all do all this within this ID environment also, right? So anyway, so I don't know if you like this, then uh, you install Eclipse then. All right. If not, that's okay too. All right. Yeah. Some people like to go online. I'll show you also. Uh, there's something called um, codebunk.com. So initially, you can do the following. Go to codebunk.com. It's a website you can go to. There's an online compiler uh, for different languages too. All right. So for example, you can pick your language of choice. From uh, I think some of you use other, maybe Python, some of you use C++ or Java, so I'm just stick Java here. So you can also run your program here too, all right? So here I'm just uh, write a system.out.println hello world, and when I run this, the output goes to the right hand side. Hold on. Why does it take so long? Am I online? Yeah, I think so. Class name must be name. Yeah, it is name. I don't know why I don't see the I saw it at home though. You see hello well here? I, I, I don't know. That's the problem with an online compiler. You are not in control. You're just running other people's setup and all that. Anyway, so um, I rather that you, uh, you folks actually uh, install your JDK on your environment. Uh, it's a lot easier. Alright, All right, let's continue then. So anyway, there's a slice here. It's once a while, there's a little program here. In theory, I can just run it. I usually have to... I, I, in fact, I, will, I give you all the source code. If you want, you, in case you want to see what it looks like. And you can uh, uh, run it manually, or you can run the ID environment for, for such a program. There, all right? So anyway, it shows you how to run such a Java program. You run Java C, remember, for your compiler. Compile it to the bytes codes. And then you run the interpreter on the class file. You don't have to specify dot class. It's understood. In fact, they tell you no file extension. You just specify the name of the class file. Right. So now they tell you what a Java program will look like in, in more detail. Right. Uh, simple Java program. You see there's two slash here. That if, if we call it forward slash. By the way, this is called forward. This is called backward. All right. The forward slash. All right. So when you put two slashes here, that means from now on, I think you write from here all the way to the end of a line. It's not, it's not read by the compiler. It's read by humans. So you write down something, remind yourself what you want to do here. All right? So this is just a comment only. So we call this a Java comment. It's ignored by the compiler. They don't read this. All right? There are two styles of comments in Java. You can also write it like this. Write anything you want, the whole block. But you have to close it with this. 
character. Make sense? All right. So this is a different style of a comment there. So this one is useful when you have one line of comment to write. This is useful when you have a whole block of comments you want to write also. Right. But all in all, uh, your program is here. It's within a program, within a class file. And um, uh, the meaning of public class and all will be, uh, will be obvious in the future. Don't worry for now. Uh, for now, every class you define will be uh, a public class. And uh, this is a class name. Class name must be uh, uppercase. And the file must be called simple.java. Right. And uh, the body of the class file will be de delineated with this pair of braces. Opening brace and end brace. That marks the beginning and the end of your class file. Right. I'm going to tell you the area is the body of the class. Simple. All the data methods of the class will be between this pair of curly braces. Right. So, and uh, you also remember when you run a Java program, the operating system look for a method called main. So that's a body of main. So they start running your program basically with the first statement in this uh, function here. So that is the program I'll show you. All right simple class and uh, the main function they run this statement and that's it that's the end of the program all right so basically the operating system comes in here run this line, line here it's so all is the end of it so they transfer the control back to operating system they go and do other things that the operating system would want to do does that make sense to everyone all right, all right. so we talk about uh, comments ignored by the compilers the two four slashes all right so the key was like public class here. They tell you you're defining a class called simple. All right. Curly braces tells you the start and the end of that uh, of maybe a body of a class or maybe the body of a, uh, a function. Okay. Uh, the operating system is actually looking for the main function. Main function uh, is uh, every Java application must have a main method. That's how they start executing your program. All right. So this is called a statement, all right? So in this statement here, what it does is it's sending the contents here to a monitor, actually to the, we call it a console, all right? Now notice that there's a double quote here, all right? So what they're sending is actually not the whole thing, but only the content within the double quote. This is called a string, all right? So they're sending a string of content, all right? Uh, if you re recall how I run this, you see the whole comment the uh, hello world on, on the uh, output of the console. Right. So anyway, this, this is a uh, very simple program. All right. So a uh, few comments the author wants to make. Um, comments are ignored. And uh, class files are terminated by code within the curly braces. Uh, headers, uh, curly braces, all put in the context of the body of either function or each other class. So in addition to uh, double slashes or forward slashes, there are the meanings of these special characters, right? For example, sometimes you see uh, parentheses. Uh, this is used, for example, to enforce the order of evaluation. Suppose I want to do this. I want to evaluate 5 times 2 plus 4. So in Java evaluation, there's a certain order of precedence, all right? Uh, multiplication and division have higher precedence than plus sign and minus sign. So when they evaluate this, they will multiply 5 times 2. Let me then write like this. Or 4 plus 5 times 2. All right. So the way they evaluate this, they will first multiply 5 times 2, add to 4, so the result will be 14. But sometimes I want you to, I want to add 5 to 4 first. You can enforce, you can ask them to have a higher precedence, by putting parentheses here first. So that means parentheses is high precedence than your multiplication sign. All right? So here they will add 5 to 4, become 9. 9 times 2 is 18. Make sense? All right. So this is maybe the meaning of some of the parentheses. Uh, maybe for, in this may be for a method call. In, there are different meanings. Sometimes for, for enforcing a, a high precedence. Sometimes be for, to mark what we call a prompt on this. Way too early to talk about this. We haven't, we don't even know what a function is yet, right? Uh, open braces, 
uh, close braces or curly braces tells you the start and the end of a function call or maybe a body. Uh, the quotation mark is not quite right. This should be like this. All right. So on a keyboard, that's the one next to your enter key. All right. So this is how you define the strings, for example. Semicolon is used to mark the end of a uh, statement. All right. So those are meanings of those characters, or punctuation marks, or characters. So uh, I didn't do it. So the author did this. He didn't. Uh, he. So I use the ID environment. The author shows you how you have done all, uh, all the things I was doing without the ID environment, right? So you write your programs. You uh, use a text editor on this directory called users Tony programs, all right? And you run your Java. You want to run the program? You simply run Java simple, all right? This is a evoking the in interpreter. This is calling the class name called simple, all right? In this directory, there must be a file called simple.class so they will know uh, you are invoking the interpreter onto a simple.class file so you're running the file right now. Right. We call it the console output. All right. Do you run a program that runs on the console? Rarely. Right. So usually these days you want Windows, right? you have this kind of user interface for you to work with. Right. But this is actually, uh, so like this although it's primitive, it's the cleanest approach. So when you first learn programming, you almost will exclusively doing keyboard input and the console output. It's easy, right? Later on, you might do file input. So you don't type in your information there, you, you put all your contents in a file, right? Uh, and then when you write to output, you might write to a file also. Or you might write to a, a printer, depending on the homework assignment and things like that, right? And, um, and, uh, and if you want something fancy, you might start popping up Windows, like what I just showed you. You can input that information onto a dialog box. Right? It's all doable in Java. Right? So uh, Java classes in the standard Java library are accessed, so there are lots of things they've done for you already. Uh, we call it the Java API, Java Application Programming Interface. So in other words, you don't have to go all the way and learn how do I send a character to a monitor. You don't have to learn how do I send a character or a string to a file. You don't have to learn all this. There are APIs you already created for us already. These are libraries. You just need to know their existence and invoke into them. They are service, right? So this is, in fact, there are so many Java APIs you can use. Uh, uh, they cover almost anything that you can think of, all right? This, the API is a lot richer than C++. All right. It's C plus The language itself, a lot of things are missile or meter. You actually have to go to a third party library to bring those features. But in Java, it's built into the library already. All right. It's very nice. So we call it a Java API. All right. So uh, this is a good example. When I do a system dot out of print line, I don't have to do anything. I just need to know if I do a system dot out of print line, I'm writing the contents of these things. Within my parentheses, I was sending them to my console at that moment. All right? You don't have to know the details, all right? So they're actually using the system class from the standard library. All right? The class is called system. Maybe this class is an object called out. More, on, more about this in the future. All right? So what's the difference between print and print line? Print line means that print this content and then move the cursor to the next line when you're done. That's what print line is. Print means Print this, and then cursor stays here. Whatever that goes to there will, st will continue from that point of departure. All right. So I give you uh, uh, maybe uh, examples here. Right. So you print this one as an output, then the cursor because the print line they go to the next line, and then print on two separate lines. Right. What's the output of this though? This program. Well, it looks like we print, but don't not print line. So they print this statement here. Cursor stops here. Then when you do print again, they call you from here. That's why they, they kind of stick together. You see, after BE, they print the peer immediately. All right. And then after this, they still stay on the on. And now when you print a third time, they print the THE there. When they're done here, because you do a print line, then they move to the new one. All right. So we have to understand this kind of output now. Huh? 
Hope you understand why, right? Questions on this? Yeah. Uh, so uh, one way to go to have output on a new line is to do print line. All right. But it's actually easier if you simply tell the um, the output when I want to go to a new line. You don't have to use print line. You can use a special character. The character is called backslash n. All right. All right. So let me explain what this is. Uh, this is the first time you see a character like this. Backslash and n. This is called forward slash. Huh? Backslash. All right. This is considered one character. So no, this is two characters, right? This and this. No, no. It's considered one character. This is called escape. I don't know if they tell me. Yeah, it's called escape sequence. All right. So although it takes up two spaces, we consider a special character. This character is called new line. Whenever the computer sees a new line, they move the, the print head, if you may, to the next line. Does it make sense? All right. So that's what it means. This is considered one new character. It's an escape sequence for letter N. All right. So uh, yeah, maybe I'll give you some examples if you understand the output. Suppose I do this. System dot out dot print N. Then I do system dot out dot print. How about this? N X slash N. Do you see it? Do, do you know what the output might look like? Uh, yes. No, the program will crash. The program will crash? Uh, oh, oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, that's not my intention. Wait. So, what's the output of this one? First of all, you print a letter N here, right? So, after printing this, they do not move the cursor to the next line, right? They don't because it's a print, right? So, they print it N again. They print N here. Make sense? Then you see this new line character here, right? So they move the cursor to the next line. Alright, so suppose you have another statement here. System dot out dot print n again. Then they write n here. Does that make sense? Sorry. And the cursor or print head stays here, waiting to print something. Make sense? Alright. <clears throat> so understand they consider this just a character n, just a character n, but then they see a new line character, so move the head to the next line. Then it just print n again. Make sense? Right. So that's how we use this uh, line character, right? So along the same line, there are other characters to this other escape sequence, right? You know, this is a new line, you can do a tab, a backspace, all kinds of stuff. Alright? So for example, if you do a tab, the print moves like a tab. Like you hit the tab key. You know, tab here, so they, they look at this kind of escape sequence to do things that you might want. Alright? And notice that when you want to do a single quote or double quote, you need to do a backslash. Because they don't want to confuse your double quote here with the character double quote. Alright? So suppose I want to print out this to the monitor console, ABC, including this little double quote here. How should I write the print statement? System dot out dot print. So can someone? Yes? Um, Tell me. Mark. Yeah. Um, backslash. backslash. Mark. Yeah, that's the previous one. And then ABC. And then. Backslash quotation. Backslash quotation. And then. Mark. That's correct. Yeah. That makes sense, right? So this is to print out this character, ABC. And this is to print out this character. Make sense, right? Very good. That's very good, actually. All right, so anyway, there's some examples here. All right, All right so that's about output to the uh, console. All right, so um, uh, now let's create some variables to store our programming uh, contents and all that. All right, so, um, so when you create a variable like int value, like I mentioned, that means that there's some memory location there, we put the content there. And because it's int, they don't just take up one byte, they take up four bytes. In Java, an int takes up four bytes, four consecutive bytes then, right? What's the address of that though? So suppose take up this, 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 and this, the address is the first byte. Address will be 0, 0, 001, right? So when you assign five to value here, you're putting a point on five here, right? What do you think the output of this will be like? Can someone guess? 
the value is and that will do it here. Five. Five, right? So they print out the content that you are storing at that location. Alright. So uh, so notice that there's no double quotes around value. That means oh you want that location is containing five here, so we'll store you we'll print out the, the value is a little space and then a value of five. Right. Let me tell you. It's string literal, it's like a string constant, you print it as it is. But this one it take the value and print out the value of five. Make sense? Right. Notice that no quotes around the value, right? If they are quotes, then you print out the value V A L U E, right? Alright. Uh, the plus operator. Uh, we, we this concept is known as overloading. For the same symbol, it might mean something different, alright? If you are print if you have a string and another string here, they glue them together. I don't do this, but they glue them like with a super glue here. This you know, five minute epoxy, they are glue them. So you, you see the string here. All right. This is because this and this are strings. All right. This is a string. This is a number. What do they do when they see a plus? They convert this to a string and glue them. All right. So what about this? A string. This is a value of five, right? The value of whatever it stores. Also, they take the content and glue them into a one string. So this, they glue with a character, so they change it to a string and glue them. This changes the string and glue them. Does that make sense? All right. They don't call it gluing. Gluing is not a computable concept. They call them concatenation. Concatenate means I use a five minute epoxy and glue them together and send them out to the console. Right? But if both sides are a number, then they don't glue them, right? Four plus five is not 45. Four plus five is what? Nine. Nine, right? So they do addition. Alright? If any one of the operands is a string, they glue them. Does it make sense now? But if both are numbers, they add them. Alright? So these are called overloading in programming. Same symbol, different meaning. Alright? Uh, is there an error here? Or will this program run? In Java, you're not allowed to have a double call, start double call, and uh oh, and then do not end the double uh, the, the double quotes on the same line. This program will not run. All right, so you cannot extend a line all the way, extend a a string more than one line. It is not allowed. All right. So what you should do if you have to write something like this, a long string like this, yeah, you glue them. You basically find your five minute epoxy. Right, you see that this glue to this to this. Make sense, right? So you can you, you, you have you can you cannot like just drop this and expect them to be uh, like one. Alright? Make sense? Alright. So uh, you, you you buy your five minute epoxy glue them, right? These lines are so you see they that when they print up. So this is a continuation there, right? These these lines are, are now. Okay, whatever. These lines are, are so it becomes one long string in print them. Does it make sense? Alright. So you have to do your own uh, uh, Concatenation. Yeah, huh? All right. So here they show you container with multiple strings here. These glue to this. See, these are like numbers. All right. So how do they glue this though? Do they see? Do you see five plus uh, multiply with six? They calculate thirty here. All right. So, uh, but be careful. If you are add, then you have to put parenthesis. Does it make sense? Otherwise, they glue this to a six, and then a four becomes six sixty four. Right? So it can get you in some nasty surprises. Does that make sense, right? This is not a plus sign, that's not a problem. They know it's five times six. But this is a plus. If you don't have the parenthesis here, exciting things will happen to you. Remember old people don't want anything exciting. Alright. So here you have to have you have a question. Wait, but there's a um, second there's no like plus between the six plus four. Uh if there's no plus here? No, there's no plus between the um quotation mark and the plus. Oh, there's a typo then. Oh, geez, the author makes a lot of mistakes. Huh? He he meant this a plus here. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I I I'm I'm starting to worry about the slides. <laughs> this is kind of yeah, you're absolutely right. This has to be a plus sign. Here, right? So, but the point being that if there's a plus sign here and you don't have the parentheses here, you're in trouble because they will glue the six here, they glue the four here. Right? But because the plus have a different meaning, right? So you only put parentheses. 
Um, since I'm here, it's okay. I just modify the slide. So for my next class, I do that. No, it's okay. Well, I can change the slide. It should be a plus here. Oops. Thanks for telling me that I'm, well, that should be a plus here. Make sense? Yeah. Alright, so those are how you output the meaning of the little plus character here. All right. So identifiers. So a lot of times when you write a program, you want to store some kind of intermediate data as part of your programming. So you create what we call identifiers. They are alias names for your addresses in your RAM, right? So uh, there are rules about identifiers. First of all, Identifiers cannot use the reserved keywords. Remember the keywords? There are a bunch of lowercase keywords in any languages. You cannot use them as, as your name of your identifiers, right? And also, identifiers must uh, only contain letters, numbers, underscore. Now, this is very crazy. Uh, they don't mean the parentheses. They just mean this character. It's called underscore. They can, you can use the dollar sign too, all right? But uh, rarely will you use this, but you might use a... Uh, so let me, uh, let me give you some example then. Suppose I want to uh, define a variable to, defer, to store the interest rate of a bank account. So this is how I define this. Interest, or how about annual interest rate? I'll write something like this. Annual interest rate. I'll write something like this, all right? So notice a few things then. First of all, when I define a uh, variable, I like to use lowercase. All right. Secondly, this is called camel casing. You guys know what a camel looks like? All right. In case you do not know, a camel is like this. All right. I don't know how to draw a camel. All right. They have this kind of a hum. Does that make sense, right? Camel, not a dinosaur. All right. So these are called camel casing. All right. These are the words. Annual interest rate. So every time I have a new word here, I, I change it from lowercase to uppercase. Does that make sense? All right. So notice that a variable have, cannot have a space, right? So one way to do it is to use camel casing. Fair enough. Another way to do it is to do this, like annual underscore interest rate. Does that make sense? It's up to you. Develop your own style in your program, all right? So I usually use camel casing, all right? Uh, I, this is not a dinosaur, this is a camel, all right? Because they go lower to upper, lower to upper, etc. Right? They have three humps. Does camel have three humps? No, okay, no, whatever. All right, I, I don't know. I'm not an author, obviously. I, I fail my, uh, uh, my, my artist test or something like that when I'm a kid, all right? Anyway, or you can use underscore. Does that make sense, all right? It looks like a monster, not a camel. All right, and uh, or you can use another sign too, right? So uh, be careful though. In Java, it's case sensitive. So if you see items ordered, it's not the same as variable called items ordered. They have uppercase here, they are lower cases here. You see that? These are not the same variable, all right? So when you say these two variables are exactly the same, they have exactly the same to including the case also, right? Identify camel include spaces. That's why when I say annual interest rate, I use camel casing or use underscore to separate the words. Right. These are your reserved keywords. No variables can be defined using these keywords here. Right. So maybe take a look at those re reserved word list then. All right. Now uh, you guys see something like public. Yeah. You see class, right? This class. These are all reserved words, right? You cannot create variables using this kind of uh, names then. All right. So here's uh, two examples here. Which one is better? PR equals 0 0.0725, or sales tax rate goes to this, right? So we prefer the second one, right? Because it's A, it's like a camel casing. <laughs> it's because it's, uh, it's self-documenting, -document, right? So if I write a program, I read, if you read my program, so I know what you mean. You're using this to store your sales tax rate. Does it make sense, right? Well, I don't know what TR means, right? Maybe tax rates, but I will not know, right? So usually you want to write your program with variables like this. So it's very easy for your colleague to read. Because your colleague might have to read your program. Maybe you're gone on vacation. So someone has to maintain your software. 
Okay, some there are some bugs, right? So you, you want the program to be self-documenting, right? This is a style, right? All right. Uh, variable should start with lowercase. I mentioned this already. Lowercase camel casing, California tax rate, right? Class should be uppercase. These are not rules, though. This this not that you don't do this. They throw you in jail. Maybe no, they they won't. All right. So, but it's a good convention. All right. Uh, now we tell you something called printed data type. All right. Out of the box in Java, they give you eight printed data types. So built in. All right. Those are your int, byte, long, double, flow, etc., etc. So I'll tell you a little bit about those uh, data, about those built-in data types. Your keyword is called primitive, like caveman type of bit. No frills, no special things. It's just defining the how many bytes it contains to store certain values. That makes sense, right? This is in contrast to something called objects. Objects are usually not built in. You have to define them, or you can find them in a library. But this is part of Java's language itself. All right. The most common ones that you'll be using will be ints, will be double, maybe character, maybe booleans. All right. So one more time. Uh, all these are built-in data types. We call them primitive data types. All right. So uh, and uh, this this is very common to use integer. Maybe I'm storing in, uh, minus 125. Maybe 2064, so this is an int variable, right? If I want to store a floating point values, all right? So you can either use double or float. The norm is to store double. The difference between them is the precision, how many decimal points are they keeping, all right? So the, uh, usually people will want to use double, all right? So why would you want to use long? Long means basically a very large int. Double the number of bits to store. Why would you want numbers that large? But you may think that you don't need numbers that large. Okay, it, it does sometimes it does it, it because you really need range uh, of integers like this. So maybe I ask everyone this question. You guys know what this means? Ten or four factorial? Yeah. yeah. What does it mean? Yeah, it means four times three times two times one, right? Yeah. So this is a uh, quite a large number already, right? So if you look at something like, I think it's a 13 or 14 factor, I forgot. It already reaches the maximum number you can represent in int already. Right? So sometimes you run out of your, your, um, your, your the, the, the range of numbers you can represent already. Right? So if you're using, maybe you write a program, you calculate factorial, maybe you're carrying a probability of, or maybe you want to go to the casino, you're too young to go to the casino. And uh, you want to calculate the probability of you know, get, uh, winning craps. It's a game where they roll a dice for, for number seven or something like that. And you notice that you, you'll be using the factorial easily. And if you use int, you, just, you run out of range quickly. All right? So sometimes you have to use larger range of values too. All right? So as such, it's useful to know, so what do they represent? What ranges of values do they represent? All right? So here's a little chart to show you what range of values they represent. All right? So, uh, like I mentioned, int is, uh, has four bytes, to tell you, and it can represent numbers in this range, all the way up to about 2 billion, uh, 147 million, etc. All right? I believe 14, 15 factor already reaches this value already. So it's not very large value. Of course, if this is your bank account, that's a large value, all right? but that's not my bank account. Um, uh, not even in Zimbabwe kind of currency also. I don't I don't get amounts of money. All right. Long is eight bytes. So they just truly extend the range to something a lot larger. Can you see that? Alright, so sometimes you do want to work with a long eight bytes. Make sense, right? The real difference between flow and double is a number of bytes and it gives you the accuracy. Yeah, and they don't give you a range though, or they should. Mm -hmm. That's All right. And uh, but if you're working on something small, you can use short, maybe two bytes. <laughs> They can represent numbers all the way up to like 32,000 only. Right? And the byte is 8 bits that will only represent numbers between this way. Right? There's also a concept um, of unsigned values, but uh, not in Java though. Or, yeah. In C, they have unsigned concept, right? But not in Java. Alright, so anyway, so now you know when you declare a variable, remember how you name those variable names now? Camel casing, lowercase, you cannot use reserve keywords. And you have to tell us the data type. 
right? So uh, yeah, they are for initial data types. You can store values like this, all right? So uh, float and double are used to store floating point values. Uh, if you want more precisions, you use double. You, you don't need so use float. Let me tell you that you almost always use double. So let me tell you a story. Then, all right. So many years ago, I was working on a trade floor uh, on a company, and I was the architect. And uh, I noticed that so we are trading what we call T bonds and T bills. Those are like security instruments for governments to buy uh, bonds, like a loans basically. All right. And I noticed that when so we have a new project that's rolled out. I notice that every now and then, when we do the transactions, sometimes I, I earn a few cents. Sometimes I lose a few cents. Right? So that means that the numbers are not exactly matching with the actual order. Now, uh, I was really concerned because I don't want to go to jail. If you work with financial institutions, if you mess up the numbers, there's a lot of consequences. So I don't like that. I don't, want, I don't like to go to jail. And so I, I, and I immediately recognize someone must not be using the right precisions in the calculation. You say, oh, who cares? You, 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 your transactions are a few million dollars, every transaction and all that. The company won't care if they lose two cents here and make five cents there. No, they do care. So uh, it's good reasons to, be, to, to panic actually at that time. So immediately I recognize that. Uh, it's actually not Java, it's actually on the database level. Someone is not representing something with the right precisions. So that's why when the when man comes, sometimes run up, sometimes run down. That's why we might make a few cents, but that's why we might lose a few cents. That makes sense, right? We stop the trade flow, actually. We have to, um, after, the, um, after the, uh, the, the trading of that day, we have to stop the trade floor. We have, a roll, we have to fix the errors and put everything back in. Right? This actually happens in real life. All right? All right, so, uh, so these are double pipe types, so these are like floating point values and all that, right? Use double, right? Rarely will you ever need a float, but don't use float data, all right? So these are two examples here, float and number. Uh, in fact, by default, they expect this to be a double value. So you assign to a 3.5 to a number, they, they consider an error. You actually tell us, oh, I, I need it, I don't need the accuracy. You tell us it's a floating point value. All right. Rarely do you do this, because right. most people see they use double. All right. All right. Also, don't, don't give me the, your, your currency uh, dollar sign here, right? it's not as loud. All right. You only store memory values there. All right. oh, by the way, for when you store really large numbers there into your double, uh, they store it in the scientific notations. All right. For example, a number like this. 47281.97 is represented as this 4.728. So basically, you move this decimal point one, two, three, four points until you have this number. So therefore, it's multiplied by 10 to the power of 4. This is the number of places you move your decimal point. Right? You guys know this scientific notation in general? All right. Some of you are rather young. So this scientific notation then. All right? So what about this number then? All right. So uh, when they say this, you, you want to convert back to a normal looking numbers here. Oh, no, this is just the notation, all right? So in, when you write your programs here, you don't write minus 10 to 4, times 10 to 4. You use the symbol E for them, all right? E stands for exponent, all right? So when you write a number like this, then Java understands, right? So um, uh, this is the, you meant this in, in this representation. This is the output too. If you print out a uh, large number like this, uh, in double, they will give you scientific notation. So some examples here of use of scientific notations. Um, yeah, this can be represented in scientific notation. We represent it like this: e notation exponent. So we replace this portion with the letter e. Right. Uh, this is the other way around. You move the decimal point. One, two, three, four position. That's minus four. You move right with minus four, move left with plus <coughs> value. Right. So maybe I'll show you an example. So there's an example here, some facts. Maybe I'll bring up, which I did already. Uh, in my Eclipse environment, I call them some facts here. So I just cut and paste the program here. Some facts here. So it looks like they tell you the distance 
of the sun from Earth or something like that, and the mass of the sun. All right. So these are large numbers to represent these values there. All right. So now, um, can I show you? I should change the fonts here for a second. Anyway, uh, if you can see them, notice that uh, this class is called Sun Facts. That means the file is stored under a file called sunfacts.java. Right? When the operating system transfer control to this program, they start with this statement here. So what do they do here? Can yes, someone tell me? Um, they assign distance and mass as a double. Yeah. Both of them as two separate alias names or some memory locations. Both are double locations. And uh, so they assign a value of distance of one. So did you notice how, how we write this here? We use the letter E there. Right? All right. And then mass is 1.989 times 10 to 13 kilograms. I think it's kind of massive. All right. And then I do a system to out the print line, right? Do you see they do a contamination on the new line? Right? No problem. A string glued with this string, this value converted into a string, glued to this string, right? And the last one too. Alright, so you can run this program here. Let it tell you. This is the output. You see it? Notice the output is also in E to the E notation also. It's from here. So let me, let me ask you, do you think it would work if I put in lowercase e? Huh? So in Java, they don't care whether it's uppercase or lowercase e. Right? You can use either lowercase or uppercase e. All right? Questions on this? I just want to show you. So we look at uh, ins types, maybe ins, uh, long, etc. Uh, we look at the uh, floating type, floating point type. There's also a type called boolean. This is very important. This is how you make decisions. All right. So computers are of much use to us. Is all we do is just print out something and adding or subtraction and things like that. Right. So we all, a lot of times you have to make decisions in loops, in conditional statements, and all that. And Java have a very nice built-in a print data type called boolean. All right, don't be confused though. In C plus plus it's called bool, right? Some of you will know. In Java it's called boolean. All right. Uh, uh, Java's boolean type is much nicer than C plus plus. In C plus plus, any non-zero value is considered true. No such thing in Java. Java true really needs you to tell us it's true or false. All right. So um, uh, uh, let me. Oh, they don't give you the details. Huh? Oh, maybe I should show you that. Let's look at this example called true false dot Java. All right. Let me go to my uh, source file. True false. Huh? You can see how I do that. All right. So first of all, I would go to a source file called um, source location. Huh? So it's called chapter two. It's called true false. Huh? Yeah, true false here. Let me open another file here. All right. So they just print out the true false value here. All right. So I'll cut and paste this file here. Now this class file is called true false. That means uh, the file name must be called true false dot Java too. Right. So I will go to the uh, environment and let me right click here new a Java class I'll call it true false that's the class name All right. so I, I ignore the package I'm just using package for this for no reason but I'll paste it here All right. so um, so it, what it does is it create a variable called bool so bool is actually not allowed in C++, but allowed in Java, but it's not a keyword in Java. So, uh, and I uh, <coughs> define it to be tr uh, assign true value to this and print out the value of bool. Later, I assign to a value of false and assign it to a value and I print out also, right? So if I run this program here, just tell you true and false, right? 
uh, not so nice in uh, C++. For okay. those of you who know this kind of stuff, in C++ they give you where zero or one, not true and false. Right? But we are not here for small C++, so I'll uh, spare you all the details about C++ then. All right. Fair enough? All right. So that is about our Boolean data type. All right. We will use it a lot next week, because I'll tell you how to do conditional statements, how you do um, looping and things like that. All right. All right, so here's another primitive data type called uh, character. All right, some people like to pronounce as char. Uh, some people call it character. It's up to you. All right. So uh, these are literals, things like this. One letter only, A, Z, and uh, remember the escape uh, sequence. This is considered one character also, and character one also. All right. So what's the difference between character and strings? Um, character is like a string. It's like yeah. Can be zero to many characters too, right? Here's another way to look at this also. Character is a primitive data type, it's part of the language. They only allow you to contain one character only. Alright? And uh, strings is not a primitive data type, it's an object. So you have to bring in a string library and string the string API to use it. Alright? And uh, whenever something is an object, it is powerful. It comes with lots of utilities lots of functions that you can call. So strings are much more versatile compared to a simple character primitive data type. All right. That's one way to look at that. All right. And uh, throughout this course, we only use uh, basically some uh, uh, Roman letters. Right? We don't use any unit code. Right? And some of you might recognize other characters like uh, Chinese, Japanese, and Korean characters. Those are called those those, you know, that language is a lot more complex than the letters that we learn, right, than the terms success that we learn, right? And so to represent those characters, we do something called Unicode. Unicode means that I'm going to use two characters, two, 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 two characters, or 16 bits to represent one character. So in theory, you, I can represent two to power 16 characters. There aren't that many characters in your Chinese, Japanese, or Korean character set, right? But in either way, Eight characters is eight bits is not enough, right? So, so for Roman letters, A, B, C, etc., uppercase A, uppercase B, etc., totally there are only about what, fifty-two letters, right? So I can certainly use eight bits, which means one byte to represent a character like this, right? But in a Unicode or any Asian character, in fact, including Vietnamese character also, you are you have more than two hundred fifty-six. Characters, right? Uh, I mean, Chinese characters have, for example, is much many more than usually, usually a few thousand, right? So you cannot use one byte. That's why Unicode usually represent uh, two to sixteen individual characters, right? Sixteen because it use sixteen bits, right? We don't do anything like this in this course. Here, just want to tell you, uh, ASCII code, which is how we represent the the Roman letters, is basically compatible with Unicode. We only use like a eight bits only, but in a Unicode we use sixteen bits. Right, so this is what, how we represent a character under the cover. Suppose you want to represent letter A here. Under the cover is just a bunch of, it's just a number sixty-five. We call it an ASCII code. Uh, I forgot the, the full name for ASCII. I think some American Standard Exchange code or something like that is what ASCII stands for. Right. So uh, although we think about a letter A, we think about letter B there under the cover. Uh, they are represented as a what? Well, basically, just eight bits here. Right? They are, want to be compatible with Unicode, so they use sixteen bits. But all these bits are always zero. All right? So if you look at the numbers here, for those of you who are good with binary arithmetic, you know this means uh, this means the uh, 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 value sixty-five. All right? Uh, this is one, two, or the one, two, four, eight, sixteen. 32 and 64, 64 plus 1 is 65. That's why it is why 65 to represent the character A. All right. uh, we use 66 to represent the letter B, for example. All right. uh, this works well. In, in fact, we only need 8 bits, right? If you want to represent just the, new, the Roman letters, right? But it's because of the, uh, the uh, internationalization, the other character set, we now use the Unicode standard. And Java is, at that time, already designed for Unicode. So 
today they talk about miscellaneous topics here. Uh, uh, they also talk about uh, the concept of variable assignment. I think we talked about this already, right? So when you say um, interest rate, what we mean is that we assign a value of 6.5 to that memory location. We give it an alias name, a name, like a nickname. And uh, so, uh, so 6.5 6 is assigned to that variable called interest rate. Right? Like this. Here we create two variables called month and day. Oh, this is new though, alright? Because uh, you notice that you can do the following. You specify one data type, you write multiple variable names, but you separate them with commas. That means you're creating two variables. One is called month, the other one is called days. Both are ints. Right? So in, in, your, in, in your mind, month is now a variable that can contain ints contents. All right. Days is also a variable that contains ins content. Right? So you can save some space by creating two variables on the same line. All right. And then you can assign values to it. 2 to month, 28 to dates. And you can print them out. So when they you, you use this, they will convert the contents of month to a string, concatenate it here, and then print, out, print it out to the, uh, to the console. Alright, so once declare a variable, they can receive a value, so I'm, I'm storing values there. But it must be compatible, right? I cannot put like 2.4 to a month, right? Because you told me it's an int, you cannot put some kind of floating point value there. Alright. After receiving a value, variables can then be used in output statements in, or in any calculations that you want to. Right. Uh, you can also shorten this. You can immediately, after you create the variables, immediately store values there. That's called initialization. can be done on the same line. That's nice, right? If you know what it's supposed to contain. All right. uh, if you have to create those variables, you do not put in content and start using this. The Java compiler will know, no, 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 no. You just create the location, what is there, it's just some garbage, right? So they will complain. Trying to use uninitialized variables will generate syntax error when the code is compiled. You, don't, you can even run the program, they know you, you have made a mistake. All right. So let's look at some arithmetic operations. It applies to ints, it applies to double, to flow, all those kind of uh, Numeric uh, a built, uh, printed data type. You can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and modulus. All right. So uh, let me ask everyone then. What do you think the output of this is? System dot out dot print line. Uh, for example, I want to print out five times three. What's the output of this? Fifteen. Very good. What's the output of this then? Uh, maybe 8. 5 divided by 8. What's the output of that? 0.27. Yeah. The answer is 0. Alright. Because they do initial division. So in, in Java, this is how it works. If they, you're doing a division, they look at the operands, both are integers, right? Then they will do initial division. 5 divided by 8 is 0 with a remainder of 5. All right. So when you do 5 divided by 8, they just give you this value here. So sometimes you'll be caught by surprise. Make sense? So what if you really want to have 0 0.625? <coughs> then you do this. 5.0 then. Tell the, oh no, I don't want you to do integer division. I want you to do a uh, floating point division for me. Then they will print out the, the actual division for you. Does it make sense? All right. So anyway, so that's what they meant here. Division is actually integer division. All right, this is initial division. If you are using integer operands, unless one of them is a double value, at least one of them. All right, uh, modulus means the remainder. So if you do five modulus eight, then they give you the remainder. All right, so this is basically a remainder function. Does that make sense? All right, very useful if you are writing programs like that. All right. All right. So uh, some examples. Oh, in fact, they, they remind us about. Uh, this question here too. What's the value of 1 divided by 2? 
Zero. Zero, yeah. So you might think the answer is 0.5, but it's actually zero because it do integer division for us, all right? Integer division will truncate any test, it's giving you the quotient basically, right? Fair enough? All right. Also, they have uh, operator precedence, all right? They want you, they, uh, for example, they are smart. So when you do this, they will operate from left to right. Minus four plus three, that would be minus one. What about this? All right. This has higher precedence F than others. So four modulus three is what? Four. One. one. The remain is one, right? One times 13 is 13. So minus four plus 13 plus two, that is what? 11. That makes sense, right? Now you know how they get 11, right? So they will look at the uh, high presence operator first, then operate from left to right. So replace this with what? Uh, with uh, 13, then it do this plus this plus two. Make sense? All right. What about the next one? So if this like this, they will do this first. It's 18. For the rest, they do left to right. Six plus three is nine. Nine minus four is five. Five plus 18 is 23. Make sense? All right. So this is called operator precedence, right? You want to change it? You want to give the? You want to ask them to do something first? You put in parentheses. Remember? Alright. So that's how you can say, yeah, do this first. Oh, 5 plus 2 is 2. That really worries me. So don't look at this line. Alright? I don't know what happened to 12. Every time sliding equals 1. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Step number 1, I think. Yeah, maybe not that crazy. Yeah. <laughs> they do this first. Step number 1, so it's 20. Divide by 5 minus is 3. So what's this? Step number 3, right? Six, right? Six. Six minus twenty-five minus nineteen. So thank goodness. This is a step number. Otherwise, we're in trouble. Fair enough. All right. Now, Java has some very nice features. For those of you who come from uh, C plus plus background, you've seen this already. This is called the uh, com uh, composite or combined assignment operator. All right. So this is what I want. X equals to x plus five. So what does it mean? Well, I want to take the current value of x at 5 and then replace the value with x plus 5. Does that make sense? So now you know why I don't want to read this x equals to x plus 5. And then I go crazy. And that's not what we mean. Take the current value of x at 5 and then replace the value with that value. So for example, x might be 20. Change it to 25. That's what it means. Fair enough? All right. So for this one, this happens a lot. So in Java, you can see it right as x plus e equal 5. All right, so it's just a shorthand. You don't have to write this. You don't have to write like this. But your colleague might. So you, you go out on your classmate might. You know, you want to join, but you don't know what it meant here. This has exactly the same meaning like this. Make sense, right? All right, so you can do plus equal. You can do minus equals multiplication, division, and the uh, modulus operator. All right? Fair? All right. Now, sometimes you work with constants. You notice the author flow, flow us a lot of information, right? So just uh, to get us up on up to speed on Java program, all right? Sometimes you work with constants. So like pi or California sales tax, all right? So you want to put this into a constant. You don't want to keep typing 0.725 in your program all the time. Right. You know what? One day the governor said, no, no, we changed the tax rates in California. It's 6% now in your dream. So they changed the lower the, the tax rate. So do you have to go to your 5,000 programs in your company and looking for the word T and change it to 0.6? You're in trouble, mister. That makes sense, right? You don't do this. Right? You would therefore create a constant called Cal sales tax. Does that make sense? All right. And everywhere you, you don't have y this value in your program. So you, you, you basically search for this string and replace this string and, find, uh, and you just change this contact in one place. That makes sense, right? This is why sometimes you define a constant, right? Like pi. 3.1416, etc. Sometimes you actually create such a very, you, you, you don't want to like hard wire this, should I be using 3.14159 or should I use 3.1416, etc. right? So sometimes you define as a constant. 
Fair enough? All right. So this is the rules then, all right? It's not a crime if you don't follow the rule. You call them final. Final means that it's a quantum. You cannot change it. All right. So that means that uh, in normal program, you could just write cal sales tax equals to this uh, times 0 0.98. No, you cannot change anything. You cannot reassign a value. You can assign a value at the beginning. Once you've done once, you won't cannot change it anymore. That's the meaning of final. All right. And also, uh, it's by convention, if you are defining a uh, constant like this, you like to use all uppercase. No camel casing, all uppercase. To remind that this is special. This is used as a constant in my program. All right. So in the future, we might have homeworks where I might ask you to write a calculate area with circle and all that. You might want to define pi as a constant. Right? String class, we talk about what string is. String is a is not a primitive data type. It's an object. There are lots of functions there, and you can contain usually many characters, but it can be one character, can be zero character, it can be a null string, empty string also. Right? The key point is that string is actually a an object. All right. So here they give you the difference between primitive type and reference type. Let me explain. So whenever you define like int int n equals to 5, for example. So what it means is that n is a variable. It contains, what, 4 bytes, and we store the value of 5 there. All right. So this is called primitive data type. In primitive data type, you create a variable, you dump the content there. So this is for primitive data. All right. The other type of data is called objects. Objects are different, all right? For example, you do something like string s. Notice that string is uppercase. So it reminds me of how this is not a, uh, this is not a uh, primitive data type, all right? So you can write something like this, equals to, uh, I don't know, a string called abc, all right? So it turns out s does not store this content. s is a variable. They only store the address of a string. All right. So this string here is stored somewhere else. It's stored in some other part of your computer. All right. So here, they do not store the string ABC here. They will store the location, the address of this object somewhere else. All right. So uh, I'll tell you what this is. In a computer, they separate the area, the uh, memory into two areas. One is called a heap. One is called a stack. Most everything we talk about, and everything we talk about so far is in a stack. It's a special location called a stack. This is where you run your program. All right. But if you, whenever you use an object, the first time you use a reference variable, this is the first time, all right, then that variable does not contain the actual content of a string. Why not? Because it cannot. Suppose string is very long. Hello world, this is Monday. There's so many, so much area, right? They cannot store it there. They store it elsewhere. But they remember where they store it. They only remember the address location only. Does it make sense, everyone? So when I, whenever I draw a little dot and point at something else, this is an address only. Not the actual content of the string. All right? And uh, I'll explain this in the future in more details. The place where you keep creating all these kind of objects is called land of the free. I'm not making this up. It's called the free store. It's not this country. It's not longer free. It's called it's called a free store. Sometimes called a heap. In a heap, you create objects, but you need to remember where those objects are. All right. And the objects location are usually stored in four bytes depending on your map programming model. That's why it's very convenient to store in a variable. This variable does not store the content of ABC or the or a, a long string and all that, but it know the location of that string in the free store. We like to call the land of the free. Does that make sense? All right. Technically, for those of you, if you work with a Java developer, we simply call them the heap, the heap space. Heap is a place where you keep creating all these objects. 
All right. And but in your program, you have to remember where they are. So uh, for example, number equals assigned to 25, you store 25 there. But if you create string city name there, notice that they also write the same thing here too. They only store the address of this Charleston elsewhere. Does that make sense? Because this can be very big. Can be thousands of bytes here. So I cannot put it in, into my four bytes here. Right? So they have they can only store the address there. This object, the author doesn't tell you, store in the heap. That is your normal programming space called the uh, stack space. All right. So uh, later on, I'll tell you I'll differentiate between a stack space and a heap space. All right. So they tell you about how to create strings. Hello, uh, this is creating a string. This this has the same phenomenon, same one. But this is actually more formal. Uh, I, I want to bring everyone's attention to this keyword here, keyword new. New is a special uh, reserve word. Whenever you see the word new, that means go to the heap and create an object for me. All right. So in fact, this is the norm. It's normal to do this. Say that again. They don't have to. Java is very smart. If you, if this value here, if you, this is the only place that remember the address of this object here. If you, you if you nullify this value, so you don't store the address of this anymore, then Java knows this object is no longer needed. He will delete this for you. That's why you don't have memory leaks. Right. So Java is only language that keep looking at the heap space for those objects. They will see, are uh, there anyone in the stack that knows where you live? If there's none here, you're a piece of garbage. Because no one can find you anymore. Then you delete the object. That's how they do garbage collection. Right. But you ask a very advanced question, though. All right, I don't intend to go into details. Your question is, will there be memory leaks? When you do new and things like that, right? When you do new an object, that means you go to the heap space to create an object. All right. Java actually keeps track of the fact that you have some objects here. Is someone maintaining your address? If not, no one can find you, you must be a piece of garbage. Then you delete that object. That's how they do garbage collection. Right. More on this in the future, maybe? Oh, yeah. right. Does it make sense to everyone? Right. This is the norm. Whenever you need an object, we have not talked about objects yet, in any uh, details yet, I will tell you in the future, whenever you need an object, you do a new. So go to the heap store, to the free store, create an object for me, but then I remember where you live. I will store the address of the object. All right. So uh, that's the keyword new here. String is the only Java class that have this syntax. You don't have to call new. They know you mean, you mean uh, creating an object in the, in the heap space here, right? Any other Java classes, you must explicitly use the keyword called new. Right? So I don't like this line here, because string will give you the wrong impression how you create an object. Right? This is the exception rather than the rule. This is the rule. Uh, normally, you actually have to do a new operator. All right? uh, don't worry. We will have plenty of opportunity to look at how you construct an object in the heap space in the future. All right. I think we are almost done here. So uh, string has many uh, functions you can call. One of them is a length, right? You give me a string, I want to know how long is your string. What's, how, how long is this string here? Five, five right? Five characters, right? Uh, Hello world has more than five. So the length varies. You can ask. You can ask a string. Uh, this is a sim This is a notation. No. You want to ask how long this uh, value is? The value contains the address of a string. You use the syntax there, length, all right, and dot, all right. Ask this ask object dot length. So for this object, can you tell me your length? This is a function call. We'll know what a function call is in a few weeks. So that's why you need to have a parenthesis around it. This is a function call. So you can ask the value how long is is the string that you are containing that you have the address on. All right. So this is how you you do this. Thing. All right. So um, I will skip this slide, I don't think that's important. I think early on we talked about the comments here. In Java, this comment style means you, from now on till the end of that line, ignore everything. You're asking the compiler, you have ignore everything there, it's not part of my program, all right? I also mentioned about this block on the right here, this block of comment here, right? There's a third style too I forgot to mention. It's called Java dog comment here. These are for professional developers and all that. 
I think you write here, you can actually generate a documentation. So you write your program, you can write it is two star here. Uh, you, there are tools to go through your source code, looking for things like that here, and they print out a documentation for your program. Right, but we, we don't we won't be using Java doc in our in our assignments in this course. All right. So uh, uh, I think finally, the, yeah. In fact, yeah. That's that's what it is, right? If you use this kind of a Java doc convention, they can generate web pages like this for you. So your program can actually people can actually browse to your program's documentation and all that. Just like a, uh, uh, I mean, this is generator. You don't have to write this, right? If you tidily write all your comments in this format, they can run a tool to generate this kind of documentation for your class. Looks very professional, right? To make your program looks very professional. Right. Finally, we talk about uh, styles, indentations. So I'll give you some example. They don't. So uh, up to you. Uh, I usually write uh, a class public. Class something. I use open the brace here and end the brace here. That's one style I've been using. All right. Some people like to write like this. Brace is here. So the different styles that people use, right? Uh, I just follow the uh, Eclipse convention because I like it and I'm lazy. Usually I just use the Eclipse ID environment. So they have a default formatting, right? Uh, last but not the least, they talk about scatter class. Remember, a program is not very useful unless you're able to do some input and do some output also, right? So uh, the easiest input you can do is scanner class. Remember, a scanner class is not part of Java. It's a part of Java's API. So it allows you to enter something to your program. Right? So uh, to create such an object, so, and this object is called a scanner class object. They will read something from the keyboard into your program. All right? So notice that the syntax, they do a new operator. So they create such an object in the heap space, which allows you to input something to your program. So let me show you what it looks like on the payroll.java program. Right? Payroll.java. Go to this environment. See here? So this is quite a long program. So let me bring this in. It's called payroll, huh? all right. So I will go to a new Java class. I call it payroll. Oh, actually one word, I think. I'm not sure to use camel case. Anymore. So I didn't do anything, I'm just using the source code provided by the website of this textbook. And, uh, but I will go through this program with you though. Oh, sorry. Some thing from the past. All right. So the class is called um, payroll. Remember all the operation starts with the main function. Right? So I would create, do you see, I create a uh, four variables here. One is an object, called, the object's called name, it's a string. Three of them are primitive data types, hours, pay rates, and uh, gross pay, all right? And uh, here I have a fifth variable called keyboard. Now this is, a, this is normal. I will have to create such an object in the heap space, so I call it new operator, all right? If you want the scanner to scan something in from the keyboard, you have to in the parenthesis, tell them it's going coming in from a system dot in. That means the uh, keyboard on the computer. All right. And uh, once you create such an object called keyboard, it's very nice. You can keep ask the keyboard, give me a line. So when someone type a line, they will fetch a line into your program. You can ask them to so maybe as fetch in the name of a person. Now I can fetch in a integer next in. So uh, how many hours do you want this week? So I fetch in an integer var variable, I can fetch in a double value, which is the hourly rate, and I can do some calculation and print them out. Fair enough? All right, so let's take a look. So when I run this program,
It asks you what's my name. My name is John. How many hours did I work this week? When I work 10 hours. What's the hourly rate? Uh, I think the uh, running is ten dollars an hour. So they'll tell you, yeah, hello John, your gross pays a hundred dollars. You see that? Alright, so you can see how it notice when I'm typing something, they are reading the content into the uh, into the Java program, right? So that's the set scanner class. Remember, you when you create such an object, you have to use a new operator to indicate uh, to indicate that you want to create such an object, and you want to tie your scanner class to your keyboard. That's what indicates system property, right? right. Uh, the last thing I think I put a little demonstration already on the dialog box. That's when I pop up a little dialog box and ask the uh, input the information from a uh, from a dialog box instead. All right. So here, uh, and this is this is a bit. Uh, I think it's uh, too much. I don't think we, we need that. If you're interested, the author use some graphical user interface Java classes, like the uh, option pane, and to pop up a message dialog box. All right. And uh, he reads the information into a string. In fact, the same input name of the person. How many hours you work? You fetch an integer. How was the uh, the rates per hour? They fetch in a double value. Uh, it's all the same, except that it's a lot fancier. It's a lot more complicated because they are using the. I'll show you. They have to use the. Uh, it's called dialog class here. You notice that first of all they have to import some additional packages uh, called J of uh, called the swing package for the graphical user interface. And uh, they ask the uh, J option pane to show the dialog to ask the user what's the name of the user. They ask the user to input a hours per week and also the hourly pay rates there. And they what they do is they store the response into a string for input string for the user's name and the uh, actually no the input string for the how many hours it works. And also, the uh, input string is also used to uh, store the, the double value and the integer values. You can then subsequently pass the content into the corresponding value. What do I mean by passing? I want to show you. Uh, so what you read back in is always a string. So you present this dialog box here. What you read is always a string, including a value like 5. So you have to convert a string of 5 into an integer value of 5. To do so, you have to do what we call the parsing. Uh, I think we are a bit pressed for time. You have to pass the content of a string into a, a value. So um, in fact, if you know it's going to be integer, you pass it in an integer. If you know it's going to be a double value, you pass it into a double value. Right. So this kind of concept is called parsing. You go from a string to a numeric value. And so uh, here they show you how they pass. They get some value there, and they pass a string 1, become a byte value 1. They pass a string called 2599. These are characters 2599 into an integer value called i value. All right. So there are actually different passing uh, API you can call. It allows you to, uh, to indicate the, uh, what the string's actual numeric value is. So uh, uh, the, the, I have actually uploaded the program to your share disk. So before you go today, in fact, I think we should end the discussion now. We we we, uh, we sort of run out of time here. I want to um, I want to tell you what I'm going to sh show you on what I'm going to share with you on the share disk. All right. So in fact, this is the end of the presentation already. All right. So a few things I want to show you. First of all, on the um, share drive. So today. It's our first first week actually. Yeah. So I have actually give you the textbook. All right. So uh, in fact, there's some reading assignments. In fact, some of you ask. Uh, first of all, let me show you the homework too. All right. So I want you to read chapter one and chapter two. All right. This, this, the slides are on the chapter one and chapter two. Chapter one on the introduction. Chapter two on uh, all this general Java programming concept. All right. Uh, chapter two has a few uh, uh, homework sections there. So uh, uh, most most of them are multiple choice. 
and they give you a short programs ask you what's the uh, problem with that program and all that, right? And I would like, want to like you to work on two programming assignments. One is on, uh, but it's in the textbook. One is to ask you to input three numbers and you calculate the average. So make sure you do not do initial division, you do a uh, floating, double floating point division. And secondly, uh, there's also a, a program that asks you to print out some uh, patterns. Like you print out an asterisk, two asterisks or three asterisks, and then five, and three, and then one. So it's more like uh, playing around with your print line functions. All right. So uh, it's not real programs. I want you to sort of like play with your ID environment. That's why I assign these two programming assignments there. All right. So I'm going to give you. Uh, you're going to get a uh, invitation. You're going to get a uh, invitation to a Google Drive. So when you're done with your homework, send your response and homework to that email account. All right. Uh, this is the first week or first few weeks. I first want to understand. Most of you may may not have set up your programming environment still. Perfectly fine. All right. But uh, it's really useful to work on the homeworks to, to get the familiarity of the language. All right. So I want to show you the rest of the uh, resources I have to share this time. So in addition to the textbook and the homework assignment there, uh, I have also provided you with the, uh, the two presentation slides, the two the PowerPoints I've been presenting. All right. And the source code I provided also. You have two folders here. You go to folders, you see all the source code that I didn't have time to show you. All right. Feel free to run the source code. Check the output to check your understanding of the Java program. Does it make sense? All right. Sorry, it's really hectic for the first day. All right. It won't be like this in the future. All right. So uh, before before I let you go, let me see if you guys have any questions. All right. Yes, sir. Can you write the things you need to download on the homework? Can you say that again? Can I? Can you write the things we need to download on the homework? Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to update this file there. There's a file here called the homework. So I'm just going to update the JDK and the Eclipse installation. Is that okay? All right. Now, for those of you who feel uncomfortable, don't worry. Bring your laptop in next time. Next time, we'll, we only ch cover one chapter next time. And then I'm, I'm certainly going to have time to help you with the installation of the compiler. All right? Next time. And I also noticed that those of you are using a, a Mac. So I'll give you the instructions on the Mac. All right. Fair enough? All right. So, um, oh, before I let you go, did someone ask you to sign in this afternoon? I don't even remember. Is there a sign-in sheet around here? Oh, no, this is the...